Right, okay, I think it wasn't. <laughs> Bismillah, inna alhamdulillah wa kafa wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-mustafa wa ala ibadi alladhi nartada wa man bihuda wa mihtada wa bi athari ahl al-madina taqtafa wa ba'ad uh, People, just doing a quick sound check first and foremost and just making sure the sound is coming through loud and clear and as soon as I get a right, I'll just bring up the comments on both and then I'll move to introducing our guest, our esteemed guest for tonight. So let me just, uh, if you're tuning in, if you can just uh, do a, just just bounce back on the sound and the, the visual, I can see the sound, I have to make sure. Right, just bringing, okay, so, uh, Mah Maharab Hussein, Ahlam wa Sahlan, Ahlam wa Sahlan, people. All right, you're saying the sound is okay. We're getting an okay from Facebook. People, if there's any issues, give me a shout. Let me just t check mi gente on, uh, right, I got no idea what you're on about. <laughs> right, but I appreciate the comments. Uh, uh, for right, uh, so shukran, shukran. I take it you can all hear me loud and clear. Shukran, that was the main thing I wanted to get a confirmation on. Right now, let me just bring up before you the profile picture. Allahu Akbar. I'll just also adjust this. I think the sound is going in a bit harsh. I can just see from the equalizers. I take it. Maybe my usual people usually very prompt to tell me these things, but I think many of them might be asleep at this hour. <laughs> right, so people before you, you can see the esteemed guest for tonight is Dr. Ustad Muqtadar Khan, uh, an, uh, an Islamic studies professor and esteemed and amazing academic scholar within the fields of not only Islamic studies, but also global politics, uh, in addition to uh, Indian history and philosophy and poetry, Allahu Akbar. Somebody who currently and for over a decade has been teaching at the University of Delaware uh, in New York, I take it. And he has authored over 700 um articles and over f over four four books and 70 plus contributed to 70 plus chapters uh in various academic journals so without further ado let me just bring before you the man the myth people allahu akbar the legend assalamu alaikum uh ustad, and shukran for taking your time out wa alaikum salam and salam alaikum to all your audience and, uh, happy right. to be on this show. Shukran, shukran. It really, it's an honor to have you here. Um, I have come across some of your, uh, some of your lectures, some of your uh, kind of contributions. I know in addition to you have your channel conversation and we'll speak a bit about that later on as well. So it really, really is an honor to have you here tonight. I'm just also straightening this up thinking why am i <laughs> appearing like that so sheikh right uh, would you mind for the viewers i know many people have uh, are familiar with your work and some may be coming across you uh recently just briefly telling us a bit in your words of this journey leading to the to muqtadar khan of today because there's been a very colorful journey uh, to this maqam that you're at. In your so, words, coming from you, hailing, I know, hailing from the legendary Hyderabad Dakkan. <laughs> so, so as, as Mirza Ghalib said, I have a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which is be takalluf. Allah. So, so, so there is no takalluf. So basically, I accept uh, everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Mm. So he took my hair, no problem, whatever he does, in the hope that he will accept whatever I do. 
But <laughs> in my life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has repeatedly intervened and made course corrections. Okay. So, for example, I chose to become an engineer. Uh, and that was probably not acceptable to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I didn't enjoy it. So immediately after engineering, I did an MBA in India and then started working in the corporate world, which made me very unhappy. So I came to America to do a PhD in business and then realized that America was much more open. So I decided to ask myself if I had complete freedom to become who I wanted to be, uh, what would I become? And so the answer right. turned out to be a PhD in political thought, international relations, and Islamic political philosophy. These were the three areas in which I actually took comprehensive exams at Georgetown University. I studied with John Esposito and Andy Bennett and two very famous uh, political philosophers. Uh, and so I started writing in the area of political philosophy. My first book, Jihad for Jerusalem, is about uh, how groups make decisions, how they balance their identity with rationality. But after 9-11, I started dealing more with issues of American foreign policy in the Muslim world and also with Islamic political thoughts. I've been trying to balance the two. Mm -hmm. So I have books on Islam and democracy, on uh, Islamic political philosophy in Assam, but I also have work on American foreign policy. And now I'm currently trying to do two things. So from an Ishtihadi perspective, I'm trying to articulate what I think is a contemporaneous understanding of Islam and the Quran. So for example, I will do conversations of the Quran during Ramadan. Okay. Uh, so I'm trying to argue that Islam is not uh, anachronistic. It is not out of place, which means in Islam has a place in the West, and it is not out of time either. So Islam is not from the past, it is from the here and the now. So, but what kind of Islam should we manifest today and here is one of my quests. And I also deal with uh, foreign policy issues uh, as an American. Uh, but lately, I've been feeling guilty about abandoning Indian Muslims to the rising tide of Hindutva. So my next uh, two or three years, my work will be on the, the dangers of Hindu nationalism, both to India as well as to Indian Muslims. So there I am. And, uh, and a keen interest of uh, keen personal interest is also uh, <coughs> Islamic philosophy and mystic thought. That's something that's been an area yes. of passion as well. So after my discovery of Ibn Arabi, mm -hmm. I'm just fascinated. He just blew my mind. Wow. You know? And, uh, you know, even reading his Tafsir of the Quran, which is so tiny, uh, mm -hmm. It is more difficult than reading the entire tome of Ibn Kathir. Uh, so it was mind-blowing. And uh, so because of uh, my affinity towards philosophy, Ibn Arabi, uh, so basically there are three types of Sufisms. One is the Sufism of Jalaluddin Rumi. Okay. Must, must, so you can dance, you can <laughs> sing. So you, so you have every uh, khawali of Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan, Allahu, Allahu. This is the Sufism, to some extent, of Rumi, Maulana Rumi, you know, dating the Darvishes, etc. Right? You're searching for ecstasy in your life. Yeah. And then, and then you have, at the other spectrum, the, the Sufism of Ibn Arabi, which is philosophical. It comes from the unveiling of truths. It is like saying mm -hmm. that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves you so much that he drops uh, a veil after veil after veil as you get closer and closer. So you become a confident. Hmm? Okay. Mm. So be a confident of God. It's very similar to the Iqbal's share, I think. Khudi ko kar buland itna ke har taqdeer se pehle khuda khud bande se puche bata tiri raza kya hai. So you come so close that you so come so close to God that God is willing to confide in you. You know, so to me, that is Ibn Arabi's philosophical Sufism. And in the, in the middle, you have Ghazali, who is saying, yeah, 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 khawali bhi suno, but namaz mat chodo. You know, follow the Sharia as well as, you know. <laughs> so he's like struggling to be a Sharia compliant Sufi. So, but, so for me, I, I try to stay with Ghazali, but Ibn Arabi is my secret love, you could say. <laughs> Fascinated by him. Okay. So. Tell us, you know, Ibn Arabi, Muhyiddin Ibn Arabi, a legend and an inspiration to many, especially of late. 
Um, what what kind of stands out so much to you about the legacy of Muhyiddin ibn Arabi? I mean, if you could select, let's say, one key outstanding feature, what would that be for you? So, so for example, when you read Tabari or Ibn Qasir, you are impressed with their scholarship. Yeah. And these guys are giant thinkers, right? Uh, and Ghazali, obviously, master of the subject mm. matter and writing terms. Imagine writing something, something like Ihya Ulumuddin or Tariq Tabari or Tafsir Ibn Qasir. It would take decades, even today, with all our modern resources. But with Ibn Arabi, when you read him, you are just, it's like very different. Like, so for example, in, in Fusus al Hikam, he, he makes this point that Adam is the first mother. So he's arguing that Adam is the first mother because Adam gave birth to Eve. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, that was oh. like, oh, wait a minute, this is so postmodern, right? So post <laughs> yeah. exactly. constructed gender. Completely People would say post gender. That's what I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so when, when he did something like that, it blows your mind. And so, plus his idea of Tajalli is to me quite fascinating. You know, he takes this uh, hadith which traditionally don't like that uh, Allah, that I was hidden treasure and I wanted to be known or I wanted to be loved. And therefore, I created this entire creation to Hata, know me or love me. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So this idea that this whole creation is God manifesting Himself to be known, and so we become partners as the knowing being. Yeah. We become it's Allah an, subhanahu wa an interactional relationship. Yeah. But mm -hmm. what are we doing? We are helping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala know himself. Well, because it's, <laughs> it's, it sounds so beautiful, but I can see where people will start to find problems with that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. People will start already a hundred fatwas would have dropped right now, right? So this <laughs> idea that we become mirrors, right? That our souls become mirrors mirrors in which we reflect the divine right and the so, beautiful interpretation of al-mu'min mir'at al-mu'min and that yeah, al-mu'min yeah. one of the mu'mins in that sentence being allah because that's his name yeah. so yeah. that the believer is the mirror of of the divine i find that so just wow just soul melting he's shahid and mashud he's that which is witnessed and he's the one who is witnessing it. So basically, we are like on the side. <laughs> we are like an extra wheel. <laughs> to this you know? so to me, yeah. We've got no... There is no... <laughs> yeah. So, so, yeah, it also kind of deconstructs. Me. Like, what's the point of fana when there is no uh, mm. asl, right? No essence. That's why this idea that there is, that God is the sole reality, right? Uh, yeah. so, 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 for example, for many Sufis, Al-Haq is the sole reality. So yeah. to me, when I started reading Ibn Arabi, first through uh, Chitik's work and then directly, so yeah. I, I, he just blew my mind. And so he's not for everybody. I remember meeting somebody when I was doing early research, uh, a scholar from Hyderabad. He was just horrified that I was reading Ibn Arabi on my own. He said, no, you cannot. You should not read him. You should read him under guidance with somebody who's a master, uh, etc. And so, but, but so, so that's where my intellectual, but I also appreciate Ghazali and I understand the moderation that he tried uh, to bring uh, to the ecstatic runaway tendency of Sufism, you know, yeah. like, uh, I would have loved to see a dialogue between Mansur al-Hallaj and al-Ghazali, <laughs> but uh, yeah. I imagine that sometimes, you know. You see, I, I, so that's my interest in Sufism. Yeah, and I was going to say that I also feel that, um, see, because one of the things that really stands out for me straight away as the legacy of this great Sheikh Ibn Arabi is his, his kind of his viewing or his angle, his kind of his uh, lens on this world, his lens of compassion, 
and mercy, but that is Islam, that it is an embodiment of compassion and mercy. I find it so, um, not only so appealing, but I find it so relevant in an age where, I don't know, like in an age where people are confused about where to, to stand, about humanity as a whole, they don't know whether they're caught between, in an age of atheism versus religion, which has just become translated as dogma, in an age that is post-religion, I find, versus humanism, I, I find that this discourse of compassion, from whether his thing speaking about the punishment for people in the afterlife, to how really everybody is just drawn to God in different manifestations, even if they're wrong, he's saying, but they're still being driven by this undercurrent that is unbeknownst to them, but it is still God. Um, even if they're getting it, you know, they end up worshipping some stone or they end up worship, but the drive behind it is this yearning for God. And to the extent of things like even people who commit suicide, and you'd think that religion is so harsh on this point, but yet Ibn Arabi, you find him transmitting that actually Allah says, that, oh my God, it's almost in a, like as a, almost, uh, you know, somewhat wrong, um, this isn't a good analogy, but almost in saying how, you know, a child has done something wrong, but the, and the parent is like, oh. but, you know, he, he transmits this thing of Allah saying, well, oh, you know, this was so eager to meet me that, you know, ah, oh, like, you know, he can't even go to paradise. First thing he has to do is see me. This is like, see, there is a, there's a paradox there, right? So, for example, at some point you realize that uh, Ibn Arabi very profoundly believes in Qadr. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that nothing happens without the will of Allah. Even when you deny God, you need his permission to deny him. If God does not permit you to do anything, you cannot do it, PJ. Everything in this universe that exists, exists by the will of God, and everything that happens, happens with the permission of Allah. So even though suicide is considered terrible because it's an indication of despair in God, mm -hmm. right? It's like losing yeah. faith and hope. But remember, if you are destined to commit suicide, like your father, then there's no way you can go. You cannot commit suicide unless God permits you. So in that sense, Ibn Arabi's compassion towards human failings come from his, his profound belief of the sovereignty of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on everything, right? So mm -hmm. to me, that is very important. But this is much uh, more recent, um, yeah. shall we say, the last four or five years that I've been fascinated with Sufi thought uh, and so I oscillate between Ghazali, Rumi, and Ibn Could Arabi. But uh, otherwise, before that, I was more like an Islamic modernist mm. dealing with Ijtihad. I have a website called Ijtihad. I, you know, Ijtihad is something incredibly fascinating. And I know uh, that's a topic you're very passionate about. I, I am as well. And you have the website, Ijtihad.org. I want just, but just before coming to that, a final point on this. Um, you, you mentioned Mansur al-Hallaj. Uh, this is once again a very incredible personality. I feel very misunderstood uh, by people, especially of his time and, and many after. This concept of an al haq or, you know, Mafi Thob Allah, I don't see anyone but God. Uh, this concept of Fana Fila, the ego death, the annihilation of the ego. I mean, what this non-duality what, what, what could you share some thoughts on that because see one of the things about halaj is how the other sufis chickened out in trying yeah. to defend it yeah they that's fascinating i like the way you so, said that <laughs> right yeah they literally chickened out especially junaid al-baghdadi himself a great yeah. sufi leader but you know he said because he's the uh, teacher of halaj he's one of the teachers of yeah yeah, yeah he's one of the teachers basically he, he was saying that look First of all, whatever Sufis say in a moment of ecstasy should not be taken literally or seriously. That is a very simple... I, I would interview. disagree with the seriously, right. but sure, literally <laughs> but, I would agree yeah, with so, yeah, yeah, you should not take it on its face value. The second thing that he was trying to say was that uh, uh, Halaj himself should have shown a degree of maturity and being careful about 
what he's trying to say. That's why there's all these rumors going on that Sufi sheikhs have secrets with this share with their students, which they don't say publicly, etc. But my own take is, I don't know whether you're familiar with this very prominent uh, hadith al-Qudsi in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that when my the servant mm, performs uh, nawafil, he comes closer to me. Mm-hmm. And when my servant comes closer to me, uh, and, and it goes on and on. And says and until I run, or will ilayhi, I run to him. Is it that yeah, one? Yeah. Then he... But he, he sees through my eyes. Oh, he, yes, yes. And yes, until he becomes... Yeah, and he, the, the, yes, yeah. yes. So he, he, his hands do what I do. So what, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that when my servant comes so close to me that he has become fanafi fil Allah and he's in state of bakha. Wow. In Allah, right? That's, that's why he sees through the eyes of Allah, right? So that's why he speaks through. The... So that is what Halaj was saying. <laughs> yeah. It is so true, Sheikh, so true. I, I'm 100%. I feel that people, I get the fact that this discourse isn't for everyone. I get that because, you know, in life, we are at different marahil, different kind of stages. And sometimes you're not at a stage where, you know, you want to speak or hear that kind of stuff because you're just not ready for it, Uh, which is fine. I I absolutely respect that stage. And I feel that some people in life, you know how Ibn Rushd would say that some people in life, they need to just get on with life. They need to work. They need to, you know, grow crops. They need to do today's world nine to five. They need to take care of their family. They need to do this. And that's wonderful. Uh, and to some of those people, they just need Islam to be very practical. Tell me what to do. You pray five times a day. Okay, I got it. You do Hajj. Okay, I got it. You do, and and this is their world. And that, that there's nothing. That's amazing. That's wonderful. That's good. But that's why some... it's so successful in prisons because it provides structure to life. Yeah. If you notice a lot of prisoners, because suddenly prisoners find both purpose, a moral purpose, yeah. and direction and structure. So yeah. fine. That's good for you, and, but uh, and there's some people who will take it to who are at another level now. You see, they are ready to see beyond the unseeable, and for those people, there are these maqams, and and I feel that okay, I get it. The wavelengths, the frequencies don't cr- t- cross over, so people in this kind of yeah. tier don't see that sometimes. But you're right; the ulama should have had more courage, I feel, in owning that discourse. Do you, you know, I'd like to to th- throw in here, yeah, because it, it, I know it's it's controversial and people don't, sometimes religious people don't like it similarly, but this whole discussion of sacred medicine, um, things like uh, DMT or 5-MeO-DMT, uh, these things result in what people would describe as well, uh, the ego identity, kind of an ego death of the, the ego identity and a non-duality in the presence of God. And they say that they, you know, there is no more them. There is just God in, and they are in the presence of God. Uh, very similar terms to, you know, if you were to come up with a term to try and describe it and you didn't know of the Islamic terms, you would come up with terms like fana, filla or wahdatul wujud, which exactly exist. And uh, yeah. I, I was wondering, I mean, if what your thoughts are on this. So, so to me, the idea of fana is fascinating. Yeah. In Surat Al Rahman, Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala said, "Kullu man alayha fa, wa yab kafi zala." You know, the, everything that exists will perish, and the face of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala will remain. He's noble. Jalal, Jalal will akram, right? So, so what is interesting is if you, you should actually take a look at it. The sure. Quranic phrase is futuristic. That in the future, everything will perish. And the only thing that will exist is the face of Allah. So for a lot of people, it was freaking out. So what happens to Jannah and Dozakh? <laughs> These are supposed to be eternal, right? I'm going to Jannah eternally. I'm going to be there with my 70 hoods. What's going to happen? How can everything disappear? So guess what they did? They made it into pastors. A lot of commentators and say that in the past there was nothing except the face of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But to me, what is interesting is this that if you look at uh, this, is where I found Ibn Arabi making sense to me that creation is like expansion and contraction. 
And that, that's scientific as well today. Astrophysics, it's yes, expansion. Exactly. And exactly. Ex ex eventually the, the implosion. Yeah, yeah. So right now the universe is expanding. We know that for a fact because of the distances between all yeah. celestial bodies is, is increasing. Mm -hmm. But what is interesting is that this is what Ibn Arabi says, the tajalli of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is self-disclosure is this entire creation, which is just, wow, it's like, that is... he's just creating and creating and creating continuously, nonstop, like, look mm, at me, look, that's... look, this is who I am. How can you take your eyes off me, you ghafil? <laughs> you know, how can you be <laughs> ghafil of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? This is that's everything, you go out there, there is the sun, there is the moon, the universe, right? So this is fascinating. So, so it is from the face of Allah that all of this is going on. And that is why we say inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun. Everything belongs to Allah and to Allah it will return. Mm. And when we say that it just don't mean we are going to die and go back to Allah. It also means that everything from comets to stars will go back to Allah. Yeah. And that is a state of that is a state of creational fana. Mm. But but you know this uh, tradition where the Prophet Sallallahu said die before you die. Yeah. So right? Uh uh, and also so, that when a person dies, his qiyamah has happened. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. But what is interesting is that when the, the Prophet is saying die before you die, what he's trying to say is kill your ego before you physically die. So that is the state of fana where you don't exist. Mm. So, you know, people have this uh, in the Bollywood, they will say, Ek jism do jaan. Kya baat hai, Dr. Saab? Aap to dil ki baat kar rahe hain. This is fana, right? Yeah. This is fana. So even though I'm, this is one body, but there are two of us living in this. Two souls, God, right? in, you know, yeah. embodying one body. Allah. Yeah. So, mm. so, so that is what uh, this is so fascinating. A lot of this, uh, it's like some people are drawn towards existentialist philosophy, some towards Marxism. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, Jean Paul Sartre, before he became a, uh, an existentialist, had said that Marxism was the inescapable philosophy of our times, and then he escaped it. <laughs> so the point. <laughs> <laughs> you Sartre. <laughs> element of fitra there, right? It is an element of fitra. His, his hell is so, fascinating in a way, though, isn't it? Is uh, you know his book. Uh, it's 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 amazing, isn't it? Because it's the other. And just the, the, the kind of having to, the struggle of the ego with the other. I mean, it's an interesting kind of concept, yeah. So, so to me, I think that, that that is the whole idea of life. So, yes, uh, some of the concepts uh, that Ibn Arabi presents mm. is, uh, is you may not have the potential. Look, everybody cannot do calculus. Mm. I cannot teach calculus to everybody. Some get it right away. There are kids who can understand calculus who are 10 years old and there are 50 year old who will never get it right so philosophy a bit is like that and so it is how much allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blesses you with mm. in terms of his disclosure yeah. allah may share more of himself with you allah may share less of himself with you allah may share different aspects of his yeah because uh, i was gonna say that that i find that the beautiful thing about islam is that it has all these, you know, these f f f like unimaginable colors to it, this diversity that it caters for all these tears, that people who are like Ibn Rushd would say, he, he would have said if he was in our time, though the nine to five people, uh, it, it, but it also caters for people who are thinking, you know, shooting for the stars metaphysically and on that level of philosophy, what he would call the Ahlul Burhan, um, but and it caters for people in the middle. The three met methodologies that Ibn yeah. Rushd articulates are based on intellectual potential. Yeah, you know, I I actually have a theory of hadith which which freaks out scholars. So, for example, if my tell tell us, Doctor Saab, we love to be freaked out. <laughs> <laughs> so imagine if a middle school kid comes and asks me a question, right? about something scientific. Mm -hmm. uh, and then a college student asks me the same question. And then a graduate student asks me the same question. And then a colleague. Do you think the answer is going to be the same? 
No, it's going to be the complexity of the answer may be in direct proportion to the capacity of the person who's asking the question. I like that. I like that. The complexity right? is in direct proportion. Mm-hmm. To, to, yeah. so, so when people ask Prophet Sallallahu questions, do you think he gave a generic answer or his answers are in correspondence to the capacity to handle complexity by the person who asks the question. So when we weigh the hadith, like so for example, we know that Hadrat Ali was one of the most intellectual of companions. So the question that he would, yeah, the question that he would ask uh, and the answer the Prophet ﷺ would give to him would be very different from say something say Abu Huraira asked. Exactly. Mm. So so we never and uh, yet, yet the majority of the, the narrations are coming via Abu Huraira. Abu Huraira, yeah. Mm. So my understanding is that some of the Prophet Sallallahu answers, which means black and white or simplistic, right, are for the simple folks, right? Simpler. Like because a lot of Bedouins would come. A lot of, yes, exactly. they would come and, you know, sometimes they would manhandle the Prophet, you know, like come over here and it would upset a lot of the companions. The Prophet would be like, look, relax, relax. You know, and he would talk to them. And there's a hadith that just it really just comes right into to blanket what you're saying with the, the Prophet wasallam said, Hadithun nas qadra uqulihim, that is transmitted yeah, yeah. that speak, address people in accordance with their intellectual reason. Atuhibu an yukadzab Allahu wa rasulu. Do you wish that people deny God and his messenger? I mean, that is such a powerful idea, right? If you give an answer which, are, which is beyond the apprehension of your audience, they will deny the truth. Yeah. You know, especially in this day and age. I, I make that mistake <laughs> a lot because I do that a lot of time with people. And like we are doing right now, we shouldn't be doing this on YouTube because depending on who is listening, right? <laughs> So, but then there are those. <laughs> but we we are you know we're in that age with the proliferation of information. So it's like chalo what ab kya fark padta hai? What difference? <laughs> but there is also this this challenge that we we have is that we are also learning while we are speaking. Mm. So I'm not teaching you. I'm not preaching to you. I'm also thinking and learning while I do this, right? Yeah. So so, so sometimes, how you learn, like for example, there's a simple episode from the Prophet Sallallahu life where a, a companion was going away somewhere and he wanted to sort out certain things with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He was in a hurry. He had to leave town. And as they were talking, the Prophet Sallallahu saw a child crying. So the Prophet stops talking to him and starts talking to the kid. And trying to console the kid, and this guy was getting irritated, literally. You know, he he wanted to finish his business with the Prophet Sallallahu and leave town. Mm-hmm. So when he shows a sense of um, kind of urgency or irritability, well, anyway, he showed that I have to go. Kind. So the Prophet turns to him and says that Allah will not show mercy to those who do not show mercy to others. Yeah. You know, if you remember that, it's a very powerful one, right? So, so. You can take a very simplistic understanding of that, and then you can take a very profound understanding of that uh, uh, and ask, uh, why didn't uh, America off on 9-11 uh, turn the other cheek? What does that mean, right? In responding is to show compassion. Was America's response to 9-11 a compassionate response, or was it a belligerent response? So you can have a, a spectrum of how you understand traditions and stuff. And so, so to me, the frontier of understanding is Ibn Arabi. Uh, and that is why, and what is also something that I learned and I regret in my book, I focused a lot on Rumi. But in India, the place that we we both have like background, Ibn Arabi's philosophy is so manifest in the Hawari culture. In the what culture? Uh, the, uh, 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 Oh, oh, yes, of course. Of if course. you listen to that, that is all the Qawali in Arabic. kind of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah that, that Qawali particularly. Yeah, jo halka, Sorry, yeah, halka, Hadrabadi, the, the accent, I, 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 I missed the Qaf. So when you said Qawali, <laughs> I thought, Hawali, Hawali, Hadrabad has its own. 
that issue of half and calf is uh, an issue in my day. Bokh Qadar Khan. So <laughs> yes, I have both of it in know, my name. Z- sh- but, Ibrahim but Zog said, to... Garche mulke dakkan mein sunte hain kadre sukhan. पर कौन जाता है जोक दिल्ली की गलियां छोड़ के बट इफ यू लिसन टू इकबाल नॉट इकबाल इफ यू लिसन टू गालिब टू अ ग्रेट एक्सटेंड यू विल फाइंड दैट ऑल लॉट ऑफ हिज फिलॉसफी इज इन्फ्लुएंस्ड बाय इब्न अरबी फिलॉसफी एंड इन फैक्ट द बिगेस्ट क्रिटिसिज्म ऑफ इब्न अरबी केम फ्रॉम द सबकॉन्टिनेंट दिस होल डिबेट ऑफ वहदतुल वुजूद एंड शहदतुल शहूद या केम फ्रॉम Sheikh Rabbani, uh, Fatani, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so uh, it it is a pity that today, because of colonization, because of uh, basically Muslims have become history has made us intellectually very shallow, mm. and, and uh, we have been deprived. Uh, imagine. You know, Shah Waliullah's writings are in three languages. He wrote in Urdu, Arabic, Persian, and we mm-hmm. can't read them all. At least many of us, right? So, so anyway, that's why I. Somebody I... had asked here. I think that's a, a good point to address, uh, Doctor Saab. Whilst we're on this, they said, you know, doesn't Allah like things simple? You, doesn't this sound like what you're saying? It sounds like, oh. Um, it sounds like words which are the actual sentence the question was that it sounds like you're covering up the statement i am smarter than the rest of you that basically i have access to a certain understanding which other people who are not so intelligent don't and isn't really islam just the same for everyone and doesn't god just like simplicity so you see what what would you say to that kind of a question So, for example, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said about Hazrat Ali that uh, "Ana Madina Tulim wa Ali Babuha." Mm-hmm. He didn't say that about anybody else. There were some companions who he hugged and prayed publicly that Allah give them the knowledge of the Quran. So we know that Ibn Abbas was a great scholar of the mm-hmm. Quran. Uh, you know, uh, Ibn Masud, radiyallahu anhu. So there are three or four people who were known for it. So, like, let me read one ayah of the Quran. I understand that. i may be sounding elitist but all philosophers also sound oh, elitist, elitist. Yeah. Uh, yeah but saying that you don't get it i get it but there's an ayah in the quran that i found it kind of blew my mind i'm trying to look for it now it's the second ayah in the 67th surah of the quran 67:2 allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says bismillahir rahmanir rahim allazi khalaqa al-maut wal hayat li ablukum ayyukum wa ahsanu amalan so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying he's the one who has created Surah Al-Mulk. Well, yes, yeah, Surah Al-Mulk. Yeah. Second ayah of Surah Al-Mulk. Yeah. So, to me, when I read this ayah, it was in this room that I read it while writing my book, and I walked up. I couldn't sleep that whole night, simply asking the question: Why did he mention mouth before hayat? Mm-hmm. And also, it blew my mind that death itself is a creation of Allah. if he had not created death then we would be immortals okay if he just created life because so he's like what does it mean to say that god is he he's the one who has created death and then he has created life in order to test you with who will do ihsan in their life liyablakum ayyukum ihsanu amalan to me this ayah of the quran is the purpose of creation and the purpose of individuals Allah Subhanahu wa Ta'ala has created us to pursue wow. ihsan in our lives and ihsan is the highest form of everything the most beautiful manifestation of whatever you are so if you ask me give me a concrete example of the taj, uh, the tafsir of this ayah i will say look at the taj mahal so so this manifestation of beauty look at the calligraphy in islamic history all of this are a way in which we have tried to create ihsan why do we have to write in calligraphic form let's just print it all you know yeah. that's what it is right some people write it beautifully some people don't so if you think of thinking as a form of worship wow. okay you know you know the famous uh, saying that one hour of fikr is better than 50 years of zikr <laughs> or yeah. even salah right i would so, ju- so if the 
if I was let just me just going to add a word. I'm saying if thinking if thinking is is worship, then I think that the more complex and more sophisticated your thought. Uh, oh, the right, more okay. profounder your worship. Do you so I was going and, to ask that: Did you mean thought, thinking, or did you mean mindfulness? No, no, I don't mean mindfulness. You don't My, mean mindfulness. mindfulness is, yeah. Mindfulness is to be. It's the opposite of ghafil. Yeah. You know mm. that is, and that's not what I'm trying to say. Okay. It is trying mm. to. It's like saying you're probing into the secrets of Allah. That is a way of thinking. You're trying to come closer to Allah by trying to understand Him, right? A reflective being exploration, yes. Yes. reflective and inquiry. That's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Tadabbur al-Quran. Why did he ask us to, why did he command us to deliberate on the Quran if everybody's understanding is going to be the same? Mm. You know, why are we commanded to deliberate? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows that each one of us can extract a different understanding yeah. of the divine message. And I think we will be held accountable to what we extract. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I, 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 absolutely. And I, I would also like to to just not only second that, but to add to it by saying that I uh, definitely feel that it's not a sense of arrogance, although I recognize some people could use it that way. Uh, some people could uh, be arrogant about it, and that would be wrong. Uh, any kind of arrogance is in and of itself always is always wrong. So but this topic of uh, does Islam take everybody always to be equal intellectually? Then the Quran, anybody that reads the Quran, that's clearly not what the Quran says. So the Quran says at times, it addresses everyone, but then it will say, Inna fi dhalika la ayatan li albab. You know, the ones of deep insight, this is a message for them. Li nuha. Uh, do you, uh, we're, uh, and it mentions ta'qilun over you know a dozen times or two dozen times actually. Do you not use your reason? Do you not use your intellect? Uh, it mentions are the people. There's a verse that are the people of ilm the same as those who don't know? They're not the same. Uh, uh, you know, you touched upon one of my most favorite ayahs in the Quran, when Allah Subhanahu wa Taala describes who ulul al taba الَّذِينَ يَسْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَخُودًا وَعَلَىٰ جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ So he's saying ulul al-baba, those who are constantly in a state of zikr, right? While they're sitting, standing, uh, in a state of, even when they're lying down, they're, they're doing zikr of Allah, their mindfulness of Allah. Yeah. But they are also doing fikr on his creation. So he, that definition, it is, I think, the 190th ayah of Surah Al-Imran, right? So in that ayah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is coupling that you have to do both, zikr and fikr. That's why I like, that is Ghazali Sufism, right? Mm -hmm. Follow the Sharia, but also, you know, enjoy Ibn Arabi and Rumi both. So so this, this idea of doing zikr all the time and then also doing fikr, are ulul al bab and he creates a different this yeah. and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala use uh, different terms to talk about people of understanding people of yeah. knowledge people uh, ulul al bab which is a complex and, co so concept and, and and just like you said that really we have no problem in understanding that in the world like so we recognize not everybody is a mathematician not everybody is a physicist not everybody is even capable Unfortunately, it's like, you see, it's like if you take the physical uh, entity, we recognize not everybody physically is, they may have, they may have very overlapping similar, everybody's got the same, you know, features, mostly speaking, but they're not the same. Some people's endurance levels, athletes perform absolutely differently to the common person. Now, the intellect is no different. It is in that speaking as allegorically, it is also like a muscle. Yeah, for some people, they, they will have already certain genetic factors, but they will train it and they will enhance it. And they will have spent decades of investing and further deepening the, the kind of modalities. They won't be the same as a regular person, just as a top athlete will not be the same as a regular person, even though both have the capacity to run. But it won't be the same. Yeah. 
so the person is asking the question, I would ask them to read the story of Musa and Al-Khidr mm. in the Quran. I mean, they, they're a clear distinction between different levels of understanding. Of if course. you were to ask me to give an example of Ulul al-Bab, I would talk about the green one, <laughs> you know, oh. Al-Khidr. Mm-hmm. So, so if look at him, his knowledge of reality is informed by a prescience, which, which uh, Musa alayhi salam lacks, right? So they're looking at the same facts, but their understanding of the facts differ by, because of their maqam, for example. Yeah. Even though Musa alayhi salam's maqam is so high, so so you cannot uh, say that everybody is understanding is the same. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, not everyone are equal, those who know and those who don't. Exactly. That's actually a verse of the Quran. Yes. I would agree that at a consciousness level, we are all equal. And that's where, and that's, I mean, I personally believe that that's, that is the ruh fundamentally. So I do accept that there is that equality base of consciousness, but where it manifests in understanding and knowledge and uh, a whole bunch of other things come into play, f- ranging from genetic factors to our own learnings and, and our own strengths. So there, there, there is variation. But uh, the reason I delved on that wasn't... Let me drop a controversial bomb here. Sure, go so for it. All, 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 are... all the better. <laughs> so, like, for example, this is a problem with liberalism also, right? Mm-hmm. That we want to treat unequals as equals. Right. So the whole idea is that we are equal under the eyes of the law. So the difference between equality and equity is -hmm. the same, right? So we have to make sure that some people have been oppressed, some people have been marginalized, so we have to make up for past injustices. This is a big debate today on social justice issues, right? It's not about treating everybody equally. We are equal under the eyes of the law. As in, we are equal, equal in our right f- to be recipients of justice. Yes, and we are equal that we are both human beings. So you can't have more rights than I do. This is from a liberal perspective. But from a spiritual perspective, uh, some people are blessed more than others. If you remember, yeah. there was this companion who came to the Prophet ﷺ and said that, uh, you know, how can I compete with Abu Bakr? He prays, I pray, he does this, and he's rich. And he gives money. So the Prophet ﷺ says, why don't you after every prayer say, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. And then Abu Bakr also started doing that, right? So so because Allah Ta'ala has blessed him more than others, he is able to earn more ajr. So these are some of the different things, and right? Here the so, criticism, Dr. Saab, that people would say, well, but others don't see you entitled to that maqam of which you claim. So, for example, you I'm may not. claim to have, uh, let's say you claim to have a certain insight, and th- this isn't to just you, this is the universal you, that yeah. let's say this person, this ulil al-bab, or as Mansur al-Hallaj, or Ibn Arabi, or these people claim to have certain insights, um, and many other ulama as well, they claim to have insights, but other people deemed them um, non you know, not didn't deem them yeah. eligible for those. They said that these people are not. These people are jahil. These people are ignorant. These people are uh, misguided. These people are deluded. Oh, no, that's right. fair enough. But what? That is fine. If you think that everything that I'm saying right now is baloney, that is cool. That's all right. You, you should switch to Netflix or something, right now, right? But the point is, that doesn't give you the right to kill me. <laughs> Yeah, as they did and, to Mansur al Halaj. But yeah. let me finish. I didn't drop that controversial bomb. So, <laughs> even before the Prophet ﷺ was buried, uh, when they were selecting the first Khalifa, one of the justifications was that the Quraysh are superior. And so, mm. so if you yeah. remember the I'm, I'm that they used, Quraysh, the great yeah, controversial min min statement. Wa uzra min kum, right? <laughs> Mm. Uh, so, so, so this this argument that uh, the Khilafah you know, should this, be this a, a race, fascinating it's a, it's a racist statement. It's a racist uh, statement to say the Khilafah should be uh, always from the Quraysh. And uh, why don't people then ask this question of equality and? Stuff and there's like a that, very right? controversial hadith that repeatedly is brought by Imam Shatibi in his Muafaqat on the objectives, where he says 
he transmits the hadith of the prophet aqilu lidhawil hayati atharatihim that the slip ups or the falls of the people of status forgive them for it and it's it's quite because what uh, imam shatabi is arguing in that is that there will be people of and this it, it, as you can see especially today would be massively problematic maybe by certain people he was saying that there was there were people of prestige or when they slip up you should be more forgiving uh, and obviously that could be taken both ways it could be taken in a pro and it could be taken as a massively controversial statement i think some of these uh, these have been manufactured yeah. to salvage Moavia, basically. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so a lot yeah. of this, you know, if you look at uh, uh, Al-Power, these discussions yeah. uh, on the qualifications of the, so he has a minimum benchmark. And so he says that we have these, they should have the, the Fulan, Fulan, Fulan qualities. Yeah. And let's say you have 10 people uh, with these qualities. So, it is not necessary that the best one should be the Khalifa. The worst one can also be a legitimate Khalifa. So if you have 20 people who meet yeah. the benchmark, then the, the worst one can be. And you know what? The Americans <laughs> embrace this Ibn Mawardi's argument because in order to be the American president, you have to be 35 and natural born. And so we picked the worst of the qualifiers like Donald Trump and made him president. <laughs> so <laughs> Mawardi was making that argument, you know, mm. that the worst of the qualified people can be. So mm. I, I could see that you can understand why he would make such an argument, right? <laughs> so he's yeah. trying to make it for, to excuse certain people who were definitely in command, but were not among the best. Sure, sure. No, that, that makes a, mm. a lot of sense. I was yeah. also seeing it from the side that there was, from a perspective, a kind of elitism. And I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm not saying it's it's a bad thing. I was just saying, well, you know, it seems to be in some of the discussions of scholars. But, you know, Dr. Saab, uh, very, from that whole topic moving in, and by the way, the reason I thought it was good to kind of delve on that topic, not so much just because somebody asked it, but because I felt it was very important that it would appear in the minds of many that hear what we're saying, to say, well, hmm, you know, this sounds like there could be an... Uh, an elitism here in I understand more than you and uh, and you know what if people think yeah but you're just a deviant so for thinking that and Ibn Arabi was a deviant and so I thought it was worth kind of engaging that and I I would also second exactly what you're saying in the sense that yes to it's not for everyone there are different maqamat and to some you see it is the nature of any understanding that people will always disagree so to a person who uh, who is you know in a position contrarian to you they would feel that what well, you know you're wrong it's as simple as that you know they would think i mean especially if they see things black and white then they would you know in a binary way they would think well this person's wrong because what i'm saying is right and my response as well to that would be that that that's wonderful like i i don't personally have any issue with that because i see islam as amazingly colorful and this is one of the beauties of Islam, it's it's vast diversity. So it caters for this person as it does for a person in Alaska, as it does for a person that is uh, so metropolitan or cosmopolitan, as it does for a scientist, as it does for a Bedouin. But this, but yeah. Isn't that tradition, ikhtilaf is rahma? Yeah, it's absolutely. That's Even, exactly what I'm saying, yeah. yeah. Not only that, but when we say this tradition among Muslim scholars to say Wallahu Alam at the end of their argument. What they are saying by saying Wallahu Alam is that, look, this is my position. Mm -hmm. uh, I could be wrong, I could be right, maybe you are right, uh, or maybe you are wrong. God knows best. And so, and there's enough uh, evidence yeah. in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I will let you, you can disagree in this world, but I will let you know in the in the hereafter where you have disagreed and what is right and what is wrong right uh, so th yeah. that is uh, and in psychology you have uh, the dunning kruger effect uh, where it shows that people who tend to know less tend to be more certain 
Ooh. And the more a person knows, so studies show that the more a person becomes uh, grounded and has expansive knowledge of an area, the less certain they become in that area. So, and this is why to the public, dumb people, and this I don't mean this to sound come off wrong, but dumb people uh, seem more intelligent and intelligent people seem dumb because you see a person who doesn't have vast training or uh, like a, a vast intellectual pursuits to them they when they speak of something they're so certain of it like they will say of course the earth is flat it's uh, of course it's flat i mean this is anybody who's that they're so certain whereas it, it, i mean that's okay that's a very simple topic but let's say you took something like because you know we've got scientific data but let's say you took something like gravity and they say, well, of course we know why gravity works. It's because everything falls down. Don't be stupid. It's like, Ugh. whereas now you ask an astrophysicist who spent decades investigating gravity and he'll be like, uh, right, um, okay, so the research is divided. Uh, we're not exactly sure. And, and he sounds very uncertain. So th this is why in populism, this is why Donald Trump won. Uh, because, you see, in populism, you just have to appeal to this kind of mindset, which is a very with certainty, and and that appears simple. So you just say, but and and it resonates. So, one of the things that many Muslim reformers have recommended is uh, liberal arts education in the Muslim world. The absence of liberal arts education uh, is this is it. You know, Israr Ahmed said this on YouTube, so it must be the truth. Uh, this is what Maudi said. This is what Mufti so-and-so said. There is an Imam Green out there. So Imam Green says it, and so that is the truth. Because uh, the, the, the epistemology, uh, uh, otherwise you will have to live with uncertainties. Yeah. And living with uncertainties, and uh, it's like saying that you don't know what you have, right? If, imagine you went, went to a doctor, and the doctor is now waiting for a test result. Uh, life would be like that, right? So for, <laughs> for think more about life, but I want to make a slightly tangential point to what you just made. So in my book, this book, Islam and Good Governance, I have a section where I took two or three ayahs of the Quran, which talk about Ahsan, and uh, compared it across many, many, literally 30, 40 mufassirs of the Quran. So for example, there are many places where Ibn Kasir will talk about uh, uh, about Mohsin without talking about Ahsan. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's like trying to talk about, it's like today, post 9-11, when you are on CNN and someone wants to talk, ask you about Mujahid, you don't want to talk about Jihad because you know how it resonates out there, right? Mm. So for him, the word Ahsan was so associated with Sufism that he didn't want to bring it up. Uh, who, so, who are we talking about? Kasir. Ibn Kathir, Ibn Kathir. Ibn Kathir yes, yeah. of course. Uh, so, but what was interesting to me was that when I was reading all these commentators, nearly a vast majority of them had very a profound arrogance in which they said, uh, now that I have understood the Quran, let me explain it to you. <laughs> oh my God, come on, man, just back off a little bit. Give us an inch. Just some uncertainty that this is what I think. I don't know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in mind, <laughs> what he yeah, means. Wow. So there's such, I, it is fascinating, yes, because uh, there is this uh, arrogance trap with knowledge can come arrogance, yeah. right? And it's so, true, it's true, yeah. So, so because you're constantly dealing with people who know less, you think you're better than them because yeah. you know more. So, so, but to me, that was so fascinating that they would just, launch into 13 page 20 page tafsir of the quran of of an ayah one ayah you know yeah. as if they have fully understood it yeah. there is some some uh, humility saying that look this is what i think yeah. you know so the contemporary mufassirs of the quran actually do show that humility you know like if you look at the study quran they will tell you look at all of these different approaches uh, and we think that this is uh, <laughs> <laughs> I do think as well, to be fair, some of them uh, probably got carried away, not got carried, but wrote expansively out of like passion. Like they got to be, you know, they get into it and they just keep writing because they're so passionate about it. And uh, But I agree with you 100% on saying that uh, knowledge 
it can uh, uh, occupational hazard of ilm can be arrogance and and i i do also feel that is this is my personal take on it that is often with less knowledge like it, as a person it's like with anything as you gain it new this a uh, oh, like a person gets a sports car new it's like ripping it around everywhere i feel that this is the same thing like you're saying as a person acquires knowledge and realizes he has more than people around him it has this kind of umph, this youthfulness to it this kind of display but as a person becomes secure with more and more knowledge i feel i and i hope this be true for that it drags them to humility uh, or it hope it, it, i hope it does uh, well, yeah the it's different with religion and different with certain things yeah Well, so, for example, if for 10 years you are trying to plan and say, I want to make this object fly, and then you make the thing fly. Yeah. So that is some kind of ilm <laughs> al-yaqeen, right, <laughs> which, yeah. which should give you a lot of self-confidence. But I think that in matters of religion, uh, one of the problems is that the message that some Sufis send out is very important, which is it's not about knowledge. It's not about uh religion it's about your relationship with god yeah. so the question is do you experience god yeah like if you're sitting alone and you're praying or reciting the quran or just sitting and watching um, you're sitting on a mountain and watching down a, a river are you with god or are you not mm. and if you can feel the divine presence and uh, you know i have heard people talk about how they awaken to the reality of god so they don't have the language to say i was spiritually awakened but they have experienced it it's like uh, seeing the prophet peace be upon him in your dreams yeah you not check how many degrees you have or how many books you have written or read before he you see him right but that's a spiritual proximity which is come from knowledge right so there are different kinds of proximities that you may seek with allah subhanahu to be able to offer salah in such a way that you are just focused on god you know so like the meaning of the word ihsan is anta abudu allah ka annaka tarahu like to work allah as if you see him so either you live life as if you see him or you are praying as if you are seeing him that is the highest manifestation of our deen right so that proximity that you get is not necessarily a function of knowledge it is a, yeah, it's sure. a gift i agree right? with you 100% it is about experience uh, experiential 100 wow that is very profound uh, professor shukran you know this this knowledge discussion leads right into when it comes to knowledge of the deen it is really about ijtihad um and it's really you know the, the whole deen really or well, not the whole deen but a huge amount of the deen is based on our interpretation ultimately of what is being said by allah in the quran because whatever way we look at it for most verses it's going to be an interpretation um right and i know you're very passionate about this as well professor and it's it's an area of of passion and interest for me as well what tell us about this i mean what what's gone because it's it's un, it's unfortunately a controversial topic as well ijtihad um yeah so what 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 are you... i mean the, the see we have some formal theories like a formal theory of khilafa goes back to al mawardi so it sometimes uh, for us it is very difficult to imagine what how people thought about it prior to him because khilafa formal, yeah yeah and with ijtihad it is imam shafi so mm-hmm. so we have this uh, usul that he came up with right a formal theory of usul al fiqh and so now most people say okay the first source of uh, of knowledge of of jurisprudence is the quran uh, yeah. and then the hadith yeah. and, and then the ijma and then you do ijtihad so first of all yeah. uh, i discuss ijma extensively there is no ijma about ijma of course <laughs> so nobody knows <laughs> that is always humorous it always gets me that one <laughs> yeah so so who's ijma so like for example after 911 uh, i i made this pronouncement saying i disagree with everybody 
About what? About everything. So now there is no now. Now there is no. <laughs> Let's start again, right? Let's build consensus, rebuild consensus, which means we revisit everything. Now people are so frightened of ijma, of ishtihad, and they impose ijma on it. Yeah. So, so my argument is that if your ijma is so solid, then ishtihad should only reconfirm it, right? So scholars who study an issue today should only confirm the past ijma if it is true divine understanding of the past. So ishtihad to me is not just finding new meanings, it is also reconfirmation of what we thought in the past as truth. Yeah. I mean, this uh, whole thing on ijma, do you... <laughs> right. Yes, yeah, sure. So ishtihad, can we look at it narrowly as a juristic tool? Mm -hmm. and to find out, are bhai kya kare, kokin haram hai ya nahi? So people will say, everything is permissive unless specifically mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> like there's no yeah. mention of Quran, uh, cocaine in the Quran, no hadith, so it should be halal. Mm -hmm. Of course not, it is not, because then you do an ishtihad and say anything that intoxicates you is forbidden and because cocaine can intoxicate. So we have to do ishtihad, right? That's a, that is to me the very narrow interpretation of ishtihad. Sure, sure. So I think Ishtihad, in a broader sense, is an instrument of tajdeed, the renewal. It is renewal of our understanding of the Quran, it is renewal of our understanding of the epistemology mm. of Islam, and it is what should drive Islamic scholarship, whether it is in the arena of fiqh or falsafa or kalam or tasawwuf. You know, so, so basically, Ishtihad is what is going on in American universities when we do research in social sciences, in natural sciences, even in literature. And that is the driver of history into civilizational in nature. I see, I see. Mm. And with COVID, you know, one of the funny things that I have is people will stand up and say, Kullu bida dalala, kullu dalala finnar, and they will proceed to give the khutbah in English. Excuse me. If every innovation is better, is then you're is good. there a? I'm just thinking. Is is, is your mic picking up? Uh, you know the earbuds. Are they picking up something? Let me uh, put it back. I think I yeah, they might. Them. Yeah, I think they might be because I think they were picking up some other. So there was some feedback, but yeah, I agree with you yeah. that there is. Uh, so 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 this idea that every innovation is bad. So you're speaking in English, using a microphone, standing up there. So isn't all of these bidders, right? But look what happened with COVID. People didn't make any noise about accepting virtual khutbahs, virtual eids. And it was like, patafat, innovation was happening so fast. It's when interesting. It People were debating, should we close mosques? Yet Saudi just shut down the haram instantly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So yes. the point is that uh, this whole debate about Ijma became even today, you know, yesterday, uh, this week, this Friday, I'm praying. Nobody's praying shoulder to shoulder in the masjid too. I have my own janimas. I'm wearing a mask. I spread my janimas and there's clear social distancing even now. So this is uh, if somebody came here from, say, 50 years ago or even five years ago, they would be horrified if, this, if they didn't know about COVID. Right. So people accepted a lot of innovations out of necessity, out of darura. Uh, under course. COVID. Mm -hmm. But I think we should think of it as darura because we have to adjust to our times. The new developments that come from science and technology make ishtihad a darura of the ummah. Uh, yeah. And just to remain uh, remain in tune with your time. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, it's a shame we don't really de kind of uh, use modern knowledge and I don't but the knowledge at our disposal today to enrich our understanding of the deen and in fact I think there's an uh, there's a there's a phobia of uh, doing that so when modern research will suggest certain insights I mean it's interesting what what <laughs> what is the religious response to it then uh, so people you know somebody sent me a question um, the, oh, that's, there was a first successful uh, artificial heart tra transplant. Uh, so they said, well, oh, my God, well, w w w what does Islam say? You know, all the teachings about the heart. So where have they gone? This person's got an artificial heart. Now. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, so where, where is so all the waswasa in the heart and where is all the devil that resides in the heart? And 
Where is because this is an artificial heart. It's not even his or her heart anymore, or a person's heart, a human's heart. It's artificial. So, <laughs> so I mean, I said okay. I'm not so intrigued by that thought, but I would I would personally be intrigued by the other element that. Um, you see, modern, what we know now is that the heart generates an electromagnetic field that is, and it kind of projects it about anything about three meters to some say between six meters in all directions around them. And this electromagnetic field that the heart creates is, is much greater than, I think, 60 times greater than that created by the brain. And so... It's fascinating and that the electromagnetic field can be detected by humans. And now research shows that we can pick it up subconsciously, uh, even though we're not aware, but we can pick up, uh, you know, magneto. We are kind of like magneto receptive. So, OK, I wonder what difference that makes, because, you know, there's this classic ancient saying about how the hearts impact people. And I know it comes down as a literary usage, but now some... Now, science shows, well, actually, hmm, we don't know how it impacts or what impact it, it is, but it does generate an actual project, a field in front of, in all directions, and that field can be detected, albeit the person doesn't know they're detecting it. So, so, so I, I just there thought, are two, hmm, yeah. There are two things to this. One is, you know, there are huge debates in, uh, in the Kalam about anthropomorphism. Hmm. About God. So, about, God. Yeah. He sat on his own. <laughs> like, what does it mean, right? That is such a, a, a primitive understanding. Yeah. yeah. This question can also fall in that. You know, like, it's like saying that if we have a test tube baby, is it a human being? <laughs> or should we treat them separately? Do they have a, <laughs> do they have a soul, right? Mm. If we clone a human being, will that human being be... So so some of this is where this this complex understanding of the deen comes in, you know. Mm. So this Juma, I'm trying to, I'm working on trying to give a khutbah about the spiritual meaning of of 9/11 because it's one day before 9/11, and there is an ayah in the in Surah Al Anam, 63rd ayah, in which Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says, "Say, who is it that delivers you from the dangers of the land and the sea?" Uh, so min zulumatil barri wal bahari. Who is it? But once you read uh, the people of Ahl Tasawwuf, they see the dangers of the land as ex exoteric and the dangers of the sea as esoteric. So the, the threat to you from outside mm -hmm. is the dangers of the land and the threat to you from the inside where your soul can be corrupted, where your heart can be corrupted. So we are not talking about a heart attack in a physical sense that will mm -hmm. stop you beating, but to, to lose your iman or to have... Is the ocean. Yes. It wow. Is. So, so that is the internal fear. It, so it, you can have two You know kinds what adds of... layers to that, uh, Sheikh, is how the ocean is also in many ways like the subconscious, isn't it? In its waves, it, in its turbulence, in its... its completely indeterminable by the people who write it and wow i just thought that's so also, profound also yeah. you know it's also a metaphor for allah right the ocean without a shore mm, <laughs> so okay it, in so its vastness it, 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 okay yeah so so for example fana is to drop a drop into the ocean it's gone now take the drop out right okay <laughs> take a drop of yeah. water and put it in the i suppose ocean. like the hadith that, that says that you know, your ibadah and, and it's nothing, yeah. it doesn't benefit except like taking a drop and putting it in the ocean, yeah, which is, gone. yeah, because so, which so, some people thought, well, you know, that's still something because when you add a drop, but actually in mathematics, adding one to infinity, it, it doesn't, it's still just infinity. It doesn't raise it. It's not a, so, uh, yeah. So like, for example, we have not fully, like if you talk from purely cognitive perspective, as to what is the different distinction between uh, consciousness and the heart. Is the consciousness a, a function of the brain or is it part of the oh, heart? Hmm. So these are scientific discussions for us to have, and I don't think that those regions necessarily overlap and trying to force them. There is a metaphorical heart. Yeah. You know, 
Uh, you know, but now, you see, they do know yeah, in research. Yeah, there is this uh, tradition which says that the entire creation is something that is cannot hold Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but the heart of the believer can encompass Allah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. That is the heart, and that's not your physical heart, yeah, yeah. the muscle heart. So we are talking about a heart as a, a, a kind of a cognitive or metaphorical mm. uh, place where your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala it's like an emotional cognition, isn't it? That hadith, I, I agree in meaning. It is a, a fabricated hadith, but in meaning, it kind of stands that this thing of saying, look, that, you know, nothing can contain God except your heart. And I was just going to add there that they do know now that the heart does contain neurons, uh, even though it's a tiny amount. It's 40,000 approximately neurons, which is nothing compared to you know, the billion connections we're going to have in the brain, but it's still something. And they're not quite sure what those neurons exactly do, but they seem to have a mind of their own. I mean, they're very tiny compared to the brain's neurons, but it's something. And this is why some research has shown that people, you know, their heart has kind of decided something before the brain could react. Um, and also, I know uh, the, when we spoke of heart transplants, we were speaking of artificial, but in those where the people have had an actual heart transplant, their personality has slightly changed. Uh, it's very fascinating. And I think these discussions really add flavor to the Islamic discourse and religious discourse. Unfortunately, it, it intimidates certain people. I mean, look, people all the time fall in love with inappropriate people. The brain tells them no, but the heart says, <laughs> I override you, right? I hear a, a I'm hearing a uh, a story here, Doctor. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no, but the, what, the point that I'm trying to make what, is what what was that, who was the one that got away? <laughs> no, nobody got away. Actually, I'm quite fortunate that way. But uh, the second thing is that people mm. also die of grief. Uh. Yeah. So that is where you can you know, talk heart, about heartbreak leads yeah, to heartbreak. actual death. Actually, yeah, yeah. 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 So, death. so, so there is something to it. Uh, we probably don't understand at this moment, so we should say, "Well, Allahu Alam." Mm. Uh, and it is quite possible that some of these are what people talk about secrets. You know, one day I was in a library and uh, I was looking for some book, and my son Rumi. He was at that time very. That's young, your son's name, name, Rumi. Bah. Room, yeah. <laughs> so, so Rumi, my I have two kids. My son's name is Rumi. My daughter's name is Ruhi. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, so, so my son oh, started. Uh, I love the he thinking. Said, look, look at this book, Abba, and I said, "What is it?" He says, "Look at this book," and it was by Abdul Khadir Jilani, Sir Al Asrar. Yeah. So, secret, secret of, of secret. secret. So he said, what does this mean? Secret of secrets. How is it a secret now that it's in the library? <laughs> Unless nobody reads it, right? <laughs> How can it be a secret anymore? And so, it's from that so, point he became a critic of... <laughs> no, actually, I opened the book. And the first thing I saw there was the tafsir of Lakhat Khalakhan al-Insan of Yahsani Tahwin. So most traditional people say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala basically... Uh, uh, the human capacity to rise and fall, right? Yeah, yeah. We can yeah. rise and, and we can succumb to, 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 to But the way Abdul Khad Jilani said, this applies to Adam al -Islam. Okay. So the Lahad Khalaqna al insana is Go sending him to earth. And I said, oh, that's so interesting. But how does he know it? Right? Because I, I don't remember any hadith in which the Prophet Sallallahu says, this is what this ayah makes. So that is where the secret of secrets comes, right? So this just is to, secret to add to, to, to that, so we understand. When you're saying, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي أَحْسَنِ تَقْوِيمِ that, uh, How does that... So Adam manifesting in the dunya? Is that, is that... So, so God created Adam with his own two hands, right? That is the belief, that he created him and he made all the angels bow to him. So he's just elevated. Nobody other than Allah has received halal tajdas except Adam. Halal. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Right. There's a halal sajda. So people, people could say Yusuf alayhi salam and all his 
people could say, you know, he, in his time, his family bowing to him and, uh, you know, so I don't think that is possible. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, but the point yeah, yeah. Halal, that's what I'm saying. So, so in a way, he was elevated to a high level, right? Yeah. And he was created from the best of models, mm -hmm. etc. And then, boom, he's brought down to earth, <laughs> literally, literally down to mm -hmm. earth. So, so it is not about uh, uh, a BMW behaving like a Ford, <laughs> that a great okay. car is actually okay. like a bad mm. car. Is this? So, I'm just giving an example that when I read that, I, it 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 had an epistemological moment for me. As a, how does he know this? Okay, how good point. Abdul, good ah, point. How does how so, does Sheikh Abdul Qadir yeah. Jilani know that? Yeah, he he thought of it. He dreamed of it. He just concocted it. Whatever it is. Uh, that is the secret of secrets. So now, right, I'm with you. I get what you said. Mm. Did he tell his students? That is the, that's where my son got very interested into it. He said, oh, that is so fascinating. So he didn't become a critique. He became what I think should be the most appropriate uh, attitude of all human beings towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, this is it. <gasps> this, is, this is how we should, wow. The numinous kind of effect, the like the, wow there, factor. There is, there is no other appropriate response to Allah. We should be so stunned by His glory, by His magnificence, you know, His no, majesty. Doc, let me ask you, people wow. will, you see, skeptics, non-Muslims, atheists will say, okay, this God that strikes awe in you this numinous effect of saying you know just i'm wow why why is this god so obsessed with i don't know with how people dress or when they choose with whom they choose to have sex or uh you know whether they trim their mustache or don't shorten the, or lengthen the beard i mean that doesn't it doesn't tally they're gonna say well you know this on one hand you speak of this or striking numinous effect of this transcendental divine being but on the other hand it sounds so almost petty to these people that look why is god so obsessed with these rituals and things how how do you respond to so, that i think it was madison one of the founders of this country who said that if men were angels we would not need law or the state it is because human beings are fallible that we need law and the state, etc. Right? So mm -hmm. I think that if you were now I'm talking I talk about it in my book on Assam, that if you became a Mohsin, mm -hmm. if you were pursuing Assam, and the only thing that was driving you was this, you know, uh, Musa alayhi salam's prayer, Rabbi Arini Umgur alayk. Ya Allah, show thyself to me so that I may gaze upon you, right? So if you're so focused on God, etc., then you don't need the external law because you become self-governing. Understand? You become self-governing. Your heart is the biggest imam. Your heart will tell you what is right and what is wrong. And because you're self-governing, you will not do that, which is something that will displease Allah. Mm. So it's not about this is moral and that is immoral, this is right and this is wrong. We should think of this pleases God, this will displease God. So if you are seeking the pleasure of God, you will not do anything that displeases God. So you become a self-governing people. People talk about areas in America, even today, uh, where people don't lock their homes. Right, yeah. people just keep the doors open yeah, yeah. because people are self-governing. You don't need the cops and police to enforce the law against theft and vandalism. People are self-governing. So I think if you have a society of believers, yeah. you know, so so I call it uh, a society of Muslims. It will be self-governing. We won't need uh, mm -hmm. an, a debate about what is the law. People will know it intuitively, right? They will know it because of their proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because of their maham, which is close to Allah. They will not be capable of doing things which are wrong. 
So now what has happened is, you know, you have heard this phrase about um, noble lies and things that philosophers do in order to maintain society and truth. Mm -hmm. So I think that uh, Muslim scholars, out of their arrogance, have taken upon themselves. Uh, have you noticed how, especially the ulama, tend to think of people as determined to do the bad thing? They have very little faith in human nature. They think human beings, if given an opportunity, will do the worst possible things. So, for example, when they're talking about homosexuality, they say, if you permit this, they'll go to bestiality. They just go to the furthest extreme immediately. So, right? So, so they have this horrible perception of human beings as if you give them an opportunity, they will do the worst possible thing on earth. And therefore, we need to have a very strict law to govern them. We need to threaten them with punishments. So we are treating the people as basically jahiliya. Mm -hmm. You know, Immanuel Kant described enlightenment yeah. as, an es as an escape from self-imposed ignorance. Wow, I like that. Self-imposed <clears throat> self -imposed yeah. ignorance. So I actually have a paper called Islamic Enlightenment. So to me, enlightenment, therefore, is to escape from the self-imposed jahiliya, mm -hmm. to be unaware of God. Our, so we should not assume that human beings will do the worst if they are given freedom. Because mm -hmm. isn't we the ashraf al-makhluqat? Aren't we the best of Allah's creation? Yeah. And aren't we the ummah of the best or the most important prophet of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? So we should expect the best of us rather than the worst of us. And that is where the issue of freedom comes. So we need to give freedom so people can be great and good, uh, well, not to restrict them from being evil. And and wouldn't you also feel that, Dr. Saab, that a lot of these things you see in these examples, like, like people will say, well, you know, why is God so obsessed with facial hair? Why is God so obsessed with these kind of things? It, a lot of these things are fiqh and not necessarily yeah. what yeah. sharia per se. They are an interpretation yeah. of what some people think is what God wants. Uh, and I'm it not saying not that... What, it is not what Allah is obsessed with. It is what the mullah is obsessed with. Yeah. Because, see, one of the challenges for everybody is how to be a good Muslim. And if you can't define for yourself what it means to be a good Muslim in this place and in this time, then you subordinate your... That's why I don't like this Sufi tradition of taking a sheikh. Mm. I mean, I'm an, I am an autonomous thinking being. Why will, I, why will I give my autonomy to somebody else? Mm -hmm. You know, Allah created me free and autonomous and he's going to judge me upon what I do based on who I am. So I think that people need to be able to understand that that, uh, that religion has... So let me give you a simple example. It's been institutionalized. Take Sunday school. Yeah, take your Sunday school, what you're teaching in your Sunday school to kids who are maybe, say, between 15 and 17, or 10 to 15, and have a final exam after one or two years of teaching. Right, I guarantee you, all the Sahaba will fail that that particular exam. <laughs> so, so, for example, <laughs> if you ask them the question, <laughs> like, <laughs> how many madaris are, <laughs> are <laughs> there? <laughs> We're gonna have like a hundred thousand fatawa of kufr. <laughs> yeah, they can say, like, if you ask the question, how many Sunni fiqhs are there? Yeah. How, which are the four major Sunni schools? Yeah. How, how, how do you, how is Hazrat Umar going to answer that? You see, you can't Yeah, like what like we're who, saying, what you're saying is that a lot of what we have today of Islam is post-Islamic uh, rhetoric exactly. and post-Islamic discourse. It didn't occur in the lifetime of the Prophet or the companions. It came exactly. centuries after. Yeah, if you say Imam Shafi said this, uh, Ibn Arabi said this, uh, uh, Ibn Rush said this, uh, and Try making that argument to Hazrat Omar and say, yeah. no, you shouldn't do this. Imam Malik said this, and guess what yeah, he's yeah. going to tell you? 
<laughs> I mean, he'll, he'll say, he, he'll go, ask, right? who on earth is Imam Malik? <laughs> yeah. yeah, who yeah. is he? Bring him to me. So that is the point, right? So are you trying to say, uh, I, I sound so much now like, uh, you know, the Salafi methodology to go back to the purity of the past, to bypass mm. the tradition. Yeah. But I tradition is useful because it helps us understand many things, but we should not make substitute you see, tradition. it's fascinating, Dr. Saab, that because Sharia, what it actually means is the reservoir. Yeah, this kind of this this oasis from where people can come to drink and water being the source of life. Yeah. Now, but there are really and the differentiation, what generally people go with is fiqh is man's understanding. So that in that sense of what the Sharia is trying to say. So in that sense, there are all books of law or these teachings or rituals. They are really, the, 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 there is no book of Sharia. There are books of fiqh, really speaking, unless they could call them Sharia. Some people use them synonymously at times. I get that. But really, when they define them, you know, they say this, that those things, if used together, then they're separate. And maybe if they use separately, they could be synonymous. That all the books of rituals and guidance we have today are books of fiqh, which are people's endeavors to interpret what they think Islam is teaching us. And, and they're very noble in their, you know, efforts and, you know, may Allah reward them and bless them. But like with any process that undergoes institutionalization, there are elements of always power and all these things involved in it. But at best, it is man's endeavor. It's not directly, it's not the same thing as saying that these things are, some of these things may be in the Quran, a small percentage, because the Quran only has a very few verses of ahkam out of the 6,200, anything between 150 to 500. Now, but all these other rulings have come through different various reportings and various fatawa and stuff like that. Yeah, they're, 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 they are all products of human ishtihad. Yeah. There's no doubt about it. They're all products of uh, ishtihad. Uh, so, for example, let me show you one of what the problem happens. So if you ask this question, who are the four great imams of Sunni school. Sure. You, Imam Malik will be one of them, right? Unquestionable. But then, yeah. then, but then when we talk of Sitta Sahi, neither the founder of the Hanbali school nor the Maliki school figures in it. Yeah. The Mubatta is not part of the Sitta Sahi, right? It's not, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 like, can you imagine? So, so, so the this is a Shafi'i that... plot conspiracy. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is, yeah, yeah. This is not Islam. Yeah, this is not right. This is not Islam. Like, oh, oh I know Muwatta. I translated Muwatta. I memorized. You know, I've I've met people who have memorized ten thousand hadiths. Okay. You know, and and yeah, so it's it's amazing, right? Ten thousand. That's longer than the Quran. Uh, so, okay. but the yeah. point that I'm trying to make is that we have complicated this whole thing over centuries, right? We have created a whole heritage. It is very rich. It's fantastic. The reading imams. Uh, you know, I can't imagine. I plan to do a series on conversation called "The Great Books of Islamic Civilization." Okay. Mm -hmm. And my argument is that if you claim to be part of the Islamic civilization, how can you not read Imam Ghazali? So you should read Ihya Alumuddin. But if you don't have the time, at least watch me. I'll explain to you in half an hour what it is all about. So it's like living in Agra and not seeing the Taj Mahal. What a miserable life, right? <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't mean, do, do you see my point? So you miss something of your own heritage, right? But the point is that Ghazali, there were Muslims before Ghazali too, who never read any of the stuff he wrote, hundreds of years before too. Imam Malik never read what Ghazali wrote. So it doesn't mean that he's not a good Muslim, right? So that is my whole point, that what we teach our children today as Islam is, is an accumulated tradition. We teach them fiqh uh, of this. So, for example, let me give you an example of the fiqh issue. Even the early thinkers made a distinction between ilm and fiqh. Mm. They understood the difference between knowledge and understanding of what is true knowledge, right? Yeah. Uh, as opposed to the sharia. So, if you ask 
anybody, if you go and Google on the net and ask imam or phone call, ask people, what do you do when you break your fast in the month of Ramadan through intercourse with your wife? And getting the answer... Rather, getting rather specific there, Professor. Yeah. So, <laughs> but now yeah, that you so asked... answer... <laughs> so there is a, I did that as a case study in my book, so I wanted to let you know. So people will say that what you have to do is the first thing that you do is you fast for 60 days. Mm-hmm. Okay, what, what is interesting is that the Hanafis are the strictest on this. Mm-hmm. So if you fast for 59 days in a row and you miss the 60th, you start again. Wow. And then you have to make sure that you fast for 60 days. Yeah. So they narrate a hadith in which a man comes and asks the Prophet, وسلم, what should I do? So the Prophet says, can you fast for 60 days? He says, fasting is my problem. I'm struggling with that. <laughs> it's a very <laughs> so popular hadith. Then, yeah, you're familiar with that tradition, right? In the end, the Prophet basically gives him a, a bag of dates, a basket of dates. and said, So he says, can you feed 60 people instead of fasting? And he says, I'm very poor. So he's, then somebody comes and gives the Prophet a basket of dates. He takes it and gives it to this man and says, take these dates and feed it to other people. And the man says, you know, I'm the poorest man in between the two mountains in Medina. So the Prophet says, go take it and enjoy it with your family. Now, this is the hadith, is the source of the fiqh, of missing the fast. And you know what people do? They actually come out and say fast for 60 days or feed 60 people. This has become the common thing, right? Yeah. So if, if Islamic law is Quran and Sunnah, and that the man went home with a basket of dates. <laughs> Why did you give the man a basket of dates? So the scholars are looking at the sunnah of the prophet and saying, oh, all the compassion of the prophet, we need to remove it. Mm. Although they're not, prophet, to be fair to them, they're not intentionally trying to do, but that's the no, result. Yeah. They, they have extracted the most toughest rule. The Hanafis extracted yeah, the yeah. most toughest possible ruling from that hadith. You know? Yeah. And what is interesting is that the Prophet ﷺ violated the Sharia according to these people because he told him you can have your date and eat it and do nothing else. Right? So how can you make that as a law when you're saying this? I find it bizarre mm. that you will take a tra- the sunnah of the Prophet and remove the rahmah from it. Yeah. And what is left, you say that is Sharia. I th- I think you see what the, yeah I th- I think that would be very problematic uh, <laughs> to say that the prophet violated the sharia astaghfirullah but I I think I'm you not see to say no no you're not saying that you're not saying that you're saying that this is what it appears it, according is, to this ruling yeah, because yeah if you ask me what you should do I'll say oh yeah. fast sixty days or give yeah. sixty people food. But the Prophet gave that guy a basket of Because dates. the it's ending of that food. hadith, the Prophet laughs, uh, not laughs at, laughs with uh, the person. And he and and then he says, you know what, take it and feed your family. And this hadith seems and, to show you know, that the whole thing isn't like it all it gives the connotation or the subtext is that this Kafara and everything isn't mandatory. It gives that yeah, kind of connotation. Exactly yeah. And you know, the, Abu Huraira, when he's telling the story, he says, uh, we could see the Prophet Sallallahu teeth. <laughs> yeah, really? he says, Hatta, you know, uh, Nawajid, who's like laughing, ex- like really. Yeah. So, like yeah. he's amused by this guy, right? Yeah. Basically, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is totally amused by this guy who is avoiding punishment from every which way. I cannot pass for 60 days. <laughs> I cannot see 60 people. Even yeah. if you give... I mean, I find to... it beautiful, Wallahi. I find that hadith so beautiful that here comes a person to, you know, because if you look at this hadith, here comes a person to say to the Prophet, I just violated a sacred commandment of the Quran, yeah, in his, it, and he, so he's coming with a confession to the Prophet. I mean, the Prophet hasn't asked him to come. He comes of his volition because he, he feels that he's, he's wronged something and he comes of his volition and look at the mercy of Allah, the mercy of this deen, the mercy of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He walks away with food for his family. 
I mean, wow. I, I'm mind blown by that hadith. But yeah. There are two versions of that hadith. The second version is after he goes back to his community, he is critical of his neighbors and tells them that, look, the Prophet ﷺ gave me dates. Okay, I've not heard this. Okay, wow. Yeah. So what, what the point I'm trying to make is that when if he had gone to any of our ulama instead of the Prophet Sallallahu he would have been stuck with either 60 days of fasting or 60 days and today. <laughs> and here, now mathematically, it, it is very expensive. We charge like $20 per day. So he would have had to give at least $1,200 or $600 mm. based on which masjid you are going to. And say, you have to pay 600 kapara. Isn't that so often, Dr. Zab, that we see in the teachings of the sunnah the, 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 of the Prophet, always this clemency but these hadith get then problemed as mushkil uh, al-athar the kind of problematic hadith. so for example the person saying oh being complained that he doesn't wake up for fajr and and the prophet saying well you know when you wake up pray or the hadith of the person saying look you know i'm not gonna pledge to five prayers and saying you know i'll only pledge to one and the prophet says well Okay, or Bani Thaqif coming to the Prophet and saying, well, you know, we'll, we'll pledge, we'll embrace, but ah, you know, and they were quite wealthy as a tribe, but we won't learn at the we won't provide you any uh, financial aid, and we, and we won't provide you any military strength. What do you say now? And the Prophet says, Ahlan wa sahlan, you know, to Islam. And, and yet, you see, these narrations of this rahmatan lil alameen, from the Prophet وسلم, are unfortunately pigeonholed in Mushkilul Athar. These are the problematic narrations, which we're not quite sure <laughs> what to do with them. And, and really, th th you know, it's something that embraces the, the believer as, well, as a Rahman. It is, it is from the fear that the ulama have that if he give these people a little rope, they'll run away. Mm. You know, that is the assumption that human beings do not have aspirations to do good by themselves. We have to hold them tight. You know, like one, one scholar argued with me, saying, oh, the prophet could do it because he was alive. But now that he's not alive, this is what we need to do. And I, I find that, I mean, there are many such traditions I give examples of in the book. I just picked this one because it's so well known, right? Yeah, uh, so, it's, a, it's, so, a, it's a good so one. When, I think it's a good example. Yeah. So I, I discuss it for like 10 pages, this whole episode and, and the way the scholars. And I also list all the fatwas. Like if you go to Al-Azhar's fatwa, if you go to the Grand Mufti of Pakistan, there's actually Tahir Usmani, I think, who issued this fatwa. They don't even talk about it. I mean, they and quote this hadith, and then they say you fast 60 days, and if you're a, and then the Hanafi fatwa, to me that was mind-blowing. Hanafis are supposed to be Al-Rai and rationalist. What kind of rationality is this that if you miss the, fifth, the 60th, you need to start and fasting again? Who said go, this? You know, going full circle to the elitism that and because many of them say it in the order as well, that, oh, uh, do you have to fast the 60 days? Is it bit tartib or is it bil ikhtiyar? Like, can you choose which of the kafara or can you? Because if you're wealthy, you see, feeding 60 people is nothing. So the famous incident from Al-Andalus when the caliph, um, he breaks his fast because <laughs> he decides to have sex. Uh, and then he says, that is, uh, is it, do I have to fast 60 days? And he's, uh, I believe it's Ibn Lubaba, the great Maliki jurist, who says it's okay to, to feed people. Um, or it was one of the Maliki jurists, obviously they were Maliki, they say it's fine, it's built, because in the Maliki method it can be by choice. Now, so, whereas the other scholars wanted to be strict on him, and they said no, like tell him it's it's not, bit, it's bit tartib, it's, you know, because it first says they have to fast, so he has to fast 60 days consecutively, and they have this debate, but the, I believe it's Ibn Lubaba, he tells him that, look, it's fine, you know, it's not, so the caliph says, oh, yeah, feeding isn't a problem. And Ibn Lubaba's argument was this is more welfare for the people. They receive more thing. But it comes back to the other scholars argument was that, see, of that bourgeoisie kind of that because he's got money, it doesn't make a difference for him. If he, you know, because it means nothing, he'll feed 60 people every day. So, <laughs> and the poor yeah. person, what does the poor person do? Because the poor person 
then just has to fast. He's like, I can't feed 60 people. <laughs> but but, uh, but, but you, you know, the initial understanding was also that uh, I think even during the time of the Sahaba, that there were some rich people who were... No, of course they were. Yeah. They, they were giving away, right? Mm -hmm. They were paying them and not fasting. Yeah. So so it is quite possible that um, if yeah. the ulama were not strict, nobody would be fasting to that. To, in America, to, everybody can pay off the kufa. Yeah, to, to me, <laughs> and, and, yeah. Uh, you see, when I said that, to me what kind of resonates once again is that hadith of the Prophet laughing with the person and really it brings into question the the whole mandatory nature of this if a person has a realization of what they're doing i'm not saying people shouldn't fast or sh i shouldn't make up the fast I, but i'm just I, saying actually, it brings that, that to question actually in that hadith the first thing is to emancipate a slave yeah so, yeah 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 but which yeah, obviously so, these people so, yeah, yeah so to me when i read that hadith especially i saw that it was very clear that there were certain things that the Prophet ﷺ was promoting because there are many other things for which in the Kufara he does say emancipate a slave, emancipate. Yeah. A slave. I mean, Islam has so, always been so big on that. Yeah. yeah. So, so, I mean, the whole point to, to end this particular section of the conversation, the point is that the, the, the ulama have produced an Islam which is not necessarily uh, sacrosanct. It is not sacred. Mm. This fiqh is not sacred. Uh, now it's a different thing that uh, if you're not in, if you're not capable of uh, of uh, creating all this knowledge, you know. So so for for example, one day I was leading the salah in the masjid and I made a mistake in my recitation and so I did such the sahu and uh, nobody noticed nothing. But one person came to me and said, why did you do such a sahu? And I said, I thought I made a mistake in my recitation. And he said, no, you didn't make a mistake in the recitation, but making a mistake in the recitation does not warrant such a sahu. Uh, if you make a mistake with the arkan, then you should do it. So he was talking from a very specific school of thought, right? Yeah. So I, I then I came back home and then started reading the fiqh of Salah because I realized I should have done that before I go and lead prayers and stuff like that, right? So yes, not everybody can go and read these fakes and make this which they have for themselves. So taqlid on some issues. But that does not mean that we should completely end ishtihad. No, of course not. And in fact, ishtihad, it's it's really the, the lifeline for this for the whole deen because it falls in all aspects. It falls in uh, in everything. It falls in beliefs to practice to you know how to treat certain rituals and and the whole thing really i'm not saying every single thing is ijtihad but there's a huge amount of interpretation so the quran does lay out the, the essential message of islam is to connect people with god so allah is one this is known but then when trying to understand god this in aqidah you've got all this ijtihad some people going in like you mentioned, anthropomorphism, some people going in like this, some people. What did the actual people in the lifetime of the Prophet believe? We we would never know when it came to the understanding of even, God. You know, even Tawheed, so when we people, this is the most important principle. Yeah. And people in English at least define it as a unity of God. Right, and, yeah. uh, you know, and, and I kept thinking about why would we talk about unity of God as a belief and not as oneness of God. Okay. Or the fact mm -hmm. that God is alone and there's nobody else worthy. In fact, the best definition that I like about Tawheed is that none but Allah is worthy of worship. Right? That's, that's so nice. I realized it. So I, I remember meeting a scholar in Turkey when this thing occurred to me and I turned to him and I said, so is this unity, our definition of Tawheed as unity of God, is that a reaction to the Christian concept of Trinity? Mm. I was just like about that? to say that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if we had met with Muslims prior to to their encounter, serious theological encounters mm. with Christians, and I can imagine when them being horrified by this concept of Trinity, uh, and they're basically dividing God into three, so, so what has happened is that even in such core as assumptions, right, uh, as to what is our la ilaha illallah, like what is the most core of our beliefs, that is impacted by our social interaction. Yeah. 
yani I'm instead of saying oneness of god we are saying unity of god because we are re- reacting to this concept of trinity of god so our, it, it, I don't want to use the word corruption here, but it is definitely influenced by the socio-political context. Like an adjustment or an alteration, yeah. yeah. Definitely, yeah, even, exactly. you see, when we think of God today, uh, when I say, by we, I mean the collective we, there are certain images, you know, for lack of a better word, or certain concepts or precepts that uh, kind of, are conjured up so one is of the, the old ma- the father in the sky kind of image which clearly comes from a christian kind of uh, uh, an impact an influence or even if we think of god as uh, in a linear uh, in a in a linear landscape as the first mover who sets creation into motion is clearly from uh, aristotle and this whole thing that later from the kalam arguments of the prime mover so god is like the first who sets into motion this domino effect that we conjure up this is clearly uh you know with the kalam theologians being brought in from the greeks it what did when the sahaba said these words what experience what kind of concepts were brought into the into the into their minds we they never spoke of and we will never know you know so so for example i mean to, the first time i heard this definition of uh, god as the cause without a cause which is mm-hmm. which is what the I'm uncaused cause or cause. the or the, yeah yeah, 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 yeah or the yeah, yeah. prime mover. so it was to me quite fascinating that a philosopher was able to you know define it in so precise terms <laughs> you know, the cause without the cause everything is is a cause and effect but there is yeah. one beautiful tradition and i don't know how authentic this tradition is that somebody asked uh, uh, imam ali whether he whether he saw god okay whether he saw god yeah and we are not talking about there are discussions about whether the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam physically saw God so yeah on the, mm-hmm. physically on the on the miraj etc right um, and uh, and in in the debates over the the tafsir of the ayat of surah the 17th surah in the quran right mm-hmm. so but uh, yeah so who did he see was it uh, oh sorry surah like, najm sorry surah najm yeah surah al najm yeah mm-hmm. and this yeah so, so yeah so but but uh, the, according to the tradition you know mari said do you think i would believe in something that i cannot see it was like a, i i said of course you believe in love <laughs> don't you and there are other things that came to my mind with with imam ali would believe in without being able to see it but the point was that the the the, the explanation is you see god with your heart right so mm. so experience so god all of yeah these, so they all had a concept of god and i i oh, i bet clearly, you clearly. that uh, they, they that is the first question anybody would have asked the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam tell us about god right we, just because we don't have tradition don't you think that would that would have been my first question the moment i took shahada or even the moment the prophet would say muqtada there is a god and i would say who is he introduce me to the god that i should worship right that is the first part of the dawa so the first conversation should be about god not about law and books and this and fiqh and firqas and all of those things are they come much much later right and um, you know during my research on ihsan i realized that uh, the hadith uh, of jibril is towards the end of uh, the life of prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam it happens in madina in the last few years and so clearly it is after miraj right so if you go by the school of thought that follows ibn abbas understanding that prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam actually saw so, god mm-hmm. uh, uh, so so it makes so much sense when when he defines ihsan as to worship allah as if you see him uh, right and then then realize that others can't and so said and if you can't see him then know that <laughs> see because it's all encompassing for everyone isn't it and, yeah, and i, I so, just I want to say that you know what you just said about the the almost innate urge like let's say you were in the time of the prophet and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam or anybody they said and the prophet taught us uh, 
uh, b- believe in God, and you'd say, "Tell me about God," you know, oh, "Tell me about God." This would, but I think the beauty uh, is so amazing when you think about it that the prophet didn't delineate or describe in detail, like he taught the names of Allah, but did not go into any description of God or the concepts was so as not to restrict this because then you would have people saying that anything that falls outside of this cannot be a, a valid experience of God. I mean, that is so beautiful when you think about it because Allah can't be restricted. No, but you should also... See, it's like... I mean, you understand Arabic grammar so well. You know, you can actually have words which exist in concept but not in reality because of the various ways in which you can conjugate the verbs etc so when some of the words in the quran which uh, the 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 arabs of mecca were hearing like rahman yeah that word didn't exist prior to the quran but the moment I, they heard it I th- they understood the word yeah i think it did they 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 say that that the Quraysh didn't used to really use it and stuff. So because they say that they because there was definitely the Rahman from Southern Arabia that was worshipped. Mm-hmm. And okay, yeah. the God, yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. But, but but the point I'm trying to make is that there's a linguistic yeah introduction to God also. Through mm-hmm. No, of course, of course, with all, all the names as right? well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if someone um, uh, actually hears all the names, now. I don't know how they would, you know, Al Malik, Al Quddus, Al Salam, Al Muhim, etc. Right, right away, so many names. So people will have different understandings of yeah. these concepts, uh, especially those who are familiar with, with the language. But I think that uh, we, we are quite confined in our understanding of God because no one ever bothered to explain to me Muhim. <laughs> so you know, the, so because I, the language go, and and even not just the language, the time lapse. So th- even Mormon, you know. Yeah. So, so you know, wow. and one of the most in- incredible thing that blows my mind is that when we do shahada and we say La ilaha illallah, we are actually practicing the sunnah of Allah, because Allah Subhanahu wa Taala also bears witness to the fact that he and he alone is worthy of worship, right, in the Quran. So so wow. to me, that is like a, right? So it's like, oh, wow, it's like meta, what our kids these days call, this is meta. <laughs> so it's a meta moment, right? And these meta moments uh, is what I think enriches your faith and brings you closer to God. Uh, uh, and, wow. and I think those things can come, you know? That is very profound that, you know, when Allah is... Al Mu'min. Yeah. What manifestations of that are we seeing? I mean, there's obviously people could take it linguistically to Aman, but what about Iman? Because really it's to do with Iman. It's not to, I mean, no, Aman is a bit. The way people generally translate that is just, he's the one who gives you faith. Uh, but mm. actually, linguistically, that's not what it means. That's not what it, it means. means he's a yeah. believer too. He is a believer. Yeah. Means yeah, the you know, there's this, uh, this book that uh, the professor from yeah. SD, and of in many ways, it's we are only we and existence is only in existence because God believes in us and God believes in it too. Because otherwise, you know, we, we wouldn't exist, existence wouldn't exist if Allah now, didn't believe in it. We, just have, to, to... we have come back to Ibn Arabi who says that. We exist because of Allah's tawajjo on us. Mm. So imagine that human existence is like a hologram. Yeah. Uh, Holographic like, universe. Wow. Yeah. So we exist as a hologram. That's not a real existence. It's like an image on the wall, like a movie. Turn the projector off, and you disappear, yeah. right? Wow. So that's why Allah is the only haq. And we are contingent realities because well, we are, profound. as yeah. long as as long as Allah's tawajjo is on us, right, we exist. And if Allah takes his tawajjo off us, we are gone. We're finished, right? Mm. But, 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 but this moment thing is important because if you notice, uh, 
the early community talked of themselves not as uh, Muslims. Like they didn't give that Muslims as Muslims. Like, yeah. Amirul Mu'minin, Amirul Mu'minin, Amirul Muslim. They and the Quran says that call themselves were, believers, not. not Muslims. Muslims yeah. is actually a, yeah. a. It wasn't alien because the term is used by extension. It's derivative in the Quran, but it wasn't yeah. a uh, a common reference term for identity i mean the quran also says don't call your st- I mean, talking to a certain people saying that you are not yet a believer you have just submitted you have just <laughs> you have it's, a, it's just it's, islam and yeah. the term islam is yeah, in the yeah, dina in the lail exactly. islam it is used yeah. but really to as an identity it appears you know in the time of abdul malik ibn marwan and that kind of post occurrence you're going to get this we are now muslims this new kind of strong identity forming. So you wouldn't have had the Sahaba going around saying, are you a Muslim? They would have said, are you a Mu'min? Are you a believer? Yeah. yeah. Do you believe? That is the yeah. question, I think. Uh, you yeah. Know. Uh, and and the, the idea is, how do you believe? Is by Aslama. Like, I, I submit. So you submit, and so you become a believer through submission. That's why Islam is submission. I remember once, my, the first time I went to And it's walk, interesting that, see, that's one aspect that everyone says, Aslim, that submit. But they, they don't go into, you see, it can also mean, because from Af'al can mean to enter into a state of, yeah? Like Ahrama, he entered into a state of sanctuary, of Ihram. Yeah, Aslama yeah. would, in that sense, mean to enter into a state of peace. And yes. yet people, unfortunately, don't translate. Maybe it's long to translate, that's why. But they say surrender, submit. And I get mm-hmm. submit means a similar thing. But I, I just find it so more profound that aslim. And this is why in the hadith that they do transmit, where the Prophet is using this word, and I, I feel that is a, a definitely a legitimate, genuine hadith. The Prophet says, aslim, taslam. You know, may enter into a state of peace, you will be peaceful. I, I, f- I find that so resonant. Even the of Quran says, Utkhulu fi silmi kafa. kafa. Yeah, silmi. Yeah, 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 yeah. Enter peace. Into peace. Without any preconditions, any yeah. reservations, right? And so, but all the translations that you see say, submit to Allah without preconditions. That is how people are defining. But I wanted to share this moment with you. When I first went to Morocco, I remember getting off the plane and walking, and then I saw this big, painting or mural of the king of Morocco, which says Amir al muminin on it. Until then, I didn't know that he uses the title Amir He does, yeah, yeah, yeah. Muhammad al yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I burst out laughing at that, you know. I said, so wow. is he... Okay, kind of... that's quite blasphemous so... in Morocco to do that. Well, <laughs> I brought it up many times. I said, so I should automatically get citizenship of Morocco, right? Because I'm a Momin too. So... <laughs> But what was interesting was that uh, after a few days, I was at an interfaith dialogue where I met the most important rabbi in Morocco. And then I asked him about why uh, Jews have such great relationship with Morocco uh, of all the countries in in the Middle East. And he said something interesting. He said something interesting. He said, because the king is Amir al I said, what do you mean? He said, we are also believers. So he's our Amir too. And if he is, was Amir al Muslim, yeah. if he was Amir al Muslim, then then they would have an issue with it, right? <laughs> so and this is, you know, this argument. I mean, not this argument, but this is amplified by uh, you know Fred Donner in his book uh, <laughs> the, about the believers, because his whole yeah. thing that really Islam was a continuation of the believers of the Judeo-Christian belief, really, that it was a continuation and it was it may be different in certain ways, modifications, but they just saw themselves as believers. And because everybody else was a believer, this is why certain early Christians or the uh, the northern eastern kind of settlers, uh, settlements saw Islam or the Muslims as just a sect of Christianity. They thought these were some Christians that were kind of, because to them, they saw that oh, these are believers, these are believers, but they are a bit different. They don't say Tawheed is like that. They do Tawheed of Allah and stuff like that. You know, uh, a lot of people also think of uh, Isa alayhi salam as a rabbi. 
So, Jewish, <laughs> Jewish <right>? rabbi. <laughs> yeah, oh, at least yeah, he's Jewish, as... right? So they're yeah. So, but so, he was Jewish. He was Jewish. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so it's a very interesting phenomenon about yeah. this. But uh, to me, it was very interesting that the rabbi who I had this dialogue with in Morocco. He was not being facetious about it. He actually, he went on to explain, look, we also believe in one God, you know, and obviously he was uh, referring to the concept of Trinity and that they don't subscribe to. So so to me, the idea, when I saw Fred Donald's book afterward, I said, oh, this is such an interesting take that yeah. he comes up with. I have that on. as well. It's and amazing. Of course, yeah. yeah. And it's, that is why, if you notice, uh, uh, Hazrat Umar and Hazrat Ali and Hazrat Osman, they use Amirul Mu'minin as their titles. Yeah, you know. But like this was everyone Hazrat because Umar. the Quran uses that. Ya yuladina yeah. amanu, ya yuladina amanu, ya yuladina amanu. It, it never says, you know, ya yuladina aslamu or ya muslimin. It will always speak about al mu'minuna ba'duhum awliya ba al mu'minuna. So this, so the early Muslims would have spoken with the language which of the Quran. To refer to their faith, yeah. I mean, God is God is not talking to the people who are practicing Islam out of fear of a state or something. Yeah. <laughs> He's talking to those who actually believe in Him, <sighs> and that mm. is what it is all about. That's why, yeah, you are living in Amen. So, so oh, you who believe, oh, you who believe, and that is a pre pre condition. And belief is a very it's a very complicated, you know, there was all this discussion about how Mother Teresa lost her faith. Like she, she had doubts. A lot of people had yeah, doubts. Yeah, that's, that's an interesting, yeah, yeah I, I, I watched that. Her letter, her, her so, kind of letters, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and even if you look at Munkhaj uh, bin Abdullah, that al writes, you know, he, he, talk, he talks about this, like, how do I know that I believe? And that was where he ran in pursuit of, right? He ran in search of belief and wanted to have this certainty of knowledge, etc. So I think that uh, Muslims, rather than focusing on these details of law and fair, should focus on these two things, which is to know God and try to inculcate Iman. Iman. Uh, Iman. And so those are the key things that we should know. Rather than just talking about Sharia, Sharia, Sharia all the time, we should be talking about Iman and but, also about Allah. Somebody is very important. could say, uh, Dr. Saab, that you see, Imam Ghazali was saying that the very thing that breaks Iman is that intellectual, philosophical kind of uh, pursuits. And, you know, that's what made him kind of break down uh, after all this questioning and philosophical inquiry. And uh, he's kind of re re recluse to a desert. Yeah, that is an argument, right? He's making yeah. an argument. That's not yeah. the truth. We don't know what the truth is, right? Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I don't think that uh, stopping thinking makes yeah. you a good believer. Exactly. But I, I mean, I, I did talk in the beginning as to how knowledge is not necessarily a function of Iman. One of my professors, who is not Muslim but has a lot of knowledge about Islam, often has this troublesome experience with Muslims who come and say, oh, you know so much about Islam, why don't you believe? Mm. So, so That's I such an absurd statement because, you see, people uh -huh. who say that, they think, because this argument is used in apostasy as well, people will say, well, if Let somebody... Let me finish this small story. Oh, so sorry, I, sorry, sorry, sorry for interrupting you. That ask them that if I take a test on Islam, do you think you will pass? And uh, like sometimes I have confrontations with people and I ask them, so you're a Sunni? He says, yes. Have you, I ask them, have you seen the Sitta Sahih that you believe in? I'm not even asking, have you read them? Have you seen them? <coughs> so the point is that people believe without having knowledge. Yeah. So if you can have Iman without Ilm, why can't this professor have Ilm without Iman? Like, what is the connection? I don't know. Why do we assume that Ilm will always lead to Iman? Yeah. So not Ilm of Fiqh or Ilm of Tariq, which will lead you to uh, Iman. It is Ilm of the Tajalliyat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which will lead you. Yeah, it's experiential, isn't it? Because if you went yeah. around the world today and you asked most people who believe in God, 
Why do they believe in God? They will say because they have personally experienced the hand of God in their lives. Uh, they will not say, unless they're just regurgitating, they won't say, I believe in God because of the cosmological argument or the teleological argument or the ontological argument. These things, these are rational kind of logical proofs that have been put up to bolster, to strengthen the argument for faith, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the reason why people on the ground actually believe in God. They believe in him because they have actually feel they've experienced him in one way or another, using the, the, the reference him, obviously, just language. But you see, so this thing I was going to say about apostasy is this is why it's so absurd that people say, oh, if a person apostated, we would, what it is, is that he would be, uh, um, he would be introduced to a person of knowledge who would then give him all the proofs for the validity of Islam. And he would have, I don't know, three days. And if he doesn't then believe, he will then be executed. Um, and and, and that, that's so uh, bewildering. I mean, it's so <laughs> amusingly bewildering because, you see, this is an assumption that faith is an information. Faith is information or an information deficit. So if, if I asked you what's the capital of, I don't know, uh, of a particular country and you said, well, I, I, I don't know. And I said, well, this is... The, the answer now you have that so first you had an information deficit now you have the information you go ah okay now ask me i'll tell you well, and look, faith is look, it's not like that talked about this right people have talked about it as ilm al yaqeen yeah ayn al yaqeen haqq al yaqeen right we are talking about haqq al yaqeen you know there was a period in my life uh, where my claustrophobia claustrophobia and Claustrophobia, fear of close yeah, places, close place spaces, yeah. uh, and also fear of heights would be had become so intense that I could not fly. So, like, imagine if I got the last seat, the corner mm -hmm. seat on a flight, it would be so scary to me. And then I started doing zikr on this simple, the zikr Allahi tasma in al khulub. You started saying with a loud voice, "Allahu Akbar" on a flight. No. No, no, nothing like that. That I would lead to a whole new phobia <laughs> that would be developed. I was sitting, actually, I was sitting in a park in Berlin waiting for a professor called Engineer, from Azgar Ali Engineer. And then I, I was reading the Quran on my phone. This, we had this old uh, move. And then I read this ayah and I said, what does it mean that the remembrance of God will bring contentment to your heart? And so I started doing silent zikr that whole period, that three days I was in Berlin. And when I sat on the plane, I have no claustrophobia or fear of heights. Yeah. So, and then sometimes it keeps coming back. Sometimes I get up at night and I feel if the light is off, claustrophobic, then all I do is I recite this ayah over and over again. Do you feel here in away. these verses, dhikr means, because dhikr can mean dhikr, that dhikru kashay, that you're uttering of something or it can be referring to your remembering so so, so would you feel that your I, mindfulness you see because i see these things as a mindfulness of god you know um, there was this experiment done i think at harvard where people were asked to wear religious clothes and walk around yeah and they found certain changes in their personalities just because they were wearing those clothes yeah okay so they became more mindful of certain religious values because they were dressed religiously. Hmm. So, so John Esposito was explaining this in a class I remember many years ago. He said, these external manifestations that you have of yeah. religion, uh, the beard, the clothes, and all the of that. Affirmations, ain't they? Yeah, they are all external. They're not just for show. At some point, you have to flip it. Mm. And it goes inside you. Yeah. So the appearance of piety and purity that you show externally by wearing white kurta pajama, <laughs> well pressed, your heart has to become like that internally. So you have to flip it inside. So I think with zikr also it is like that. Mm. And you do it with, like if you are 
thinking about it while you're doing zikr, you know, trying to think about God, trying to focus your mind on God while you're doing zikr, then I think it will eventually lead to mindfulness and insight. Yeah. And this is yeah. this is a trick that even yogis use. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, there's the many. You know, it's interesting because the verse in the Quran says when it's speaking about the destruction of synagogues and churches and temples, it says, "Fiha yuzkarusmullahi kathiran." That and the dhikr of Allah is is done in all these places a lot, and and those places are non-Muslim places that the verses of the Quran yes, that that yes. verse of the Quran uses, yep. because God is you see no one faith has a monopoly on God. God is above form or above re religions. We have an uh, a, a we have a connection in our tradition with God, but. The Jewish people also have an understanding of God. Christians have, you know, people may vary. We may disagree. Even non uh, non Ahlul Kitab have their versions of God. We may disagree, yeah. but God is so, God ultimately. Yeah. Do, do this thought experiment with me. Let's say that you and I were supposed to meet on a railway station, London railway yeah. station. So I get off the train. You're waiting for me, and I say, "Look, where are you? Look, where are you? Look." And let's say you don't know me by faith. Do you think you're going to respond when I keep calling Luke, Luke, Luke? You're not. You're yeah. thinking there's some Desi guy calling for Luke. And where is Luke? Yeah. However, if I come to your house and in your study and say, Luke, I'm here to see you, you will turn around and say, the name is Laet, not Luke, right? Yeah. And come in. So, so it's like that with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows that he alone is God. Of course. So, if, so you don't have to call him Allah for him to respond. Yeah. You can call him by any name. <laughs> of course. You can call and him. Well, uh, well, can call, him by any name. call him by anything. And he by said beautiful. all yeah. your names belong to him. So he will respond to you knowing fully well that you're calling him even though you may not have the name that the Quran has said. Of course. Right? The Quran is in Arabic. So, if you speak a different yeah, language. Arabic. You would have a different name, like in right. English would have the name God, of the word God, uh, or Khuda in in Urdu, uh, and Farsi, yeah. I guess. Which now, now people are so averse to saying Khuda Hafiz. <laughs> you uh, say Allah. <laughs> I always say Khuda Hafiz. I, I uh, yeah, I don't. I like the word Khuda Hafiz. Yeah, and I don't see why people are insecure to use it. I mean, when you say Khuda, or what, you know, you have. What's surprising, you have still people will use in Urdu when referring to God, Yazdan. Like they, they'll say, you know, the Yazdani, this, like when they, a lot of the the poetry and even a Mufti, I'm pretty sure Mufti Taqi's poetry. Or uh, I remember Junaid Jamshid had a whole, one of the Nasheeds was about uh, Yazdan. And they mean by Yazdan God. And yet Yazdan is clearly from the Z Zoroastrian conceptualization of God, which is, Islamically, we would actually find problematic, but yet they say there that's fine. Who, with the name, there are Muslims whose name is Yazdani. Yeah, and and because they no. say they say that's fine, we just have the word without that concept, which I don't I accept. But what I'm then saying is, how could you have a problem with the word Khuda? Because that's a much more transcendent meaning. It doesn't. It's not polluted like the way Yazdan is. No. But, but yeah. the same people don't have a problem with the word God. Yeah, they don't have a problem with the word God in English. They would say God. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's interesting. You know, uh, Doc, it's been epic and I know we've gone on for so long. And <laughs> I did say initially that, you know, I won't take up so much of your time, but it's been so wonderful, Allahi speaking, and just getting your thoughts, your kind of, uh, illuminations on these matters that I feel they've will be of great great contribution to people who listen. Uh, you've mentioned uh, for the viewers that you've got there are four books in print and your last book has just recently been published. Is that? Yeah, uh, that's this correct. is the book. Yeah, Ishtehad. Yeah. Yep. So if they go to ishtehad.org and look at my CV, you'll see all the books. But this book, I think people should read That's it. Islam and it's Good go Governance, where you... Governance, a political philosophy of yeah. Ihsan. Where you're speaking about so, how so, Ihsan yeah. ought to manifest within uh, a yeah. political landscape. So, so people... Paul, you... Grave is, Paul Grave is acting very badly in terms of allowing translations. So if this book's Arabic translation, it would be called Kitabul Ihsan. Wow. Okay. 
Excellent. Yeah. And I'll share the link on my uh, YouTube description uh, to ijtihad.org so people can visit the website. You go there, check it out. Um, uh, and they should also come to my channel, Conversations. I'll share the link to that as well. And where you've got some amazing, very, you know, uh, diverse discussions ranging from political to Ehsan related and about the, yeah. the, the the Sufi kind of con contributions. So, and in addition to that, if people do... Uh, I have a section on philosophy also. So, they, like, I have a, I have a whole thing on Al-Farabi and one on Ibn Khaldun. Yeah. We did. So, I did so say we, we I'd love to... I did say we want to talk about yeah. that as well. And look at that. See, when, when you get talking... Allahu Akbar, he, he just... <laughs> we will I, talk about it, inshallah. Inshallah, because, we'll, we'll definitely have to... important path of... Yeah, we'll, it's an we'll reconvene and we'll definitely do that because I was looking forward to sure. that as well. And is there a platform that you generally connect with people on, like on Instagram or something? Or So I'm on Facebook. They can follow me on Facebook. I do have a Twitter at Muhtadar Khan. Okay. And, uh, sure. So, so, so people... but, but Facebook, I interact with. If they have a question, they can come to Facebook and ask me and I can, I will, I'll be happy to engage with them. And uh, and please, uh, I know that some of the things that we have said, uh, cut and paste artists might have fun, <laughs> but yeah, but you know uh, that's I, uh, you the, know. the only thing they can take away is look to Ehsan. You know, like to if you're gonna if you're gonna refute someone, refute them by all means, but refute them in what they are actually saying, and not just trying to straw man their point by cut and paste because I, that's. The, the Quran is so clear. Ahsan, inna Allah, you people do beautiful things. God loves those who do beautiful things. But inshallah, it was good. It was nice. I enjoyed chatting with you. And I hope, uh, <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I mean, I've, I've watched some of your shows, many of your shows. Uh, the last <laughs> one I watched was your conversation with Sarah Tantawi. That was Oh, fun. yes, that was an amazing, yeah, uh, amazing. That it was, uh, so, it was. so I like this particular uh, mind trap. Uh, yeah. you know, uh, definitely and uh, uh, shukran once again for sharing your time people jazakumullah khair those of you that were viewing do check out the links I'll put them in the description do head over uh, to uh, Dr. Saab's uh, uh, website and also his pages and like and subscribe and if you haven't already liked and subscribed my page then <laughs> in this up <laughs> So, what, is the the gonna... kufara? what is the kufara for that? <laughs> <laughs> then fast 60 days consecutively, you good for nothing. <laughs> no, guys, much love to you all. Take very good care of yourselves. Wassalamu alaikum alaykum and khuda hafiz. Likewise, Dr. Saab, take care. Assalamu alaikum. I'm going to bring up the my uh, subscription page so people, if you haven't liked, do so. Uh, and if you want to show some extra love and support, then head over to Patreon. <laughs> We've got that choice as well. So guys, over and out. Wassalamu alaikum.